Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Happy New Year. Um, this is my first live stream of 2024. So um, it, I hope you had, if you celebrate at all, I hope you had a fantastic uh, break, Christmas, Yule, um, New Year. I definitely did. I had a couple of weeks off. I always take two weeks off over this time of year just to rest, recuperate. I think it's really important uh, that we as humans do take that absolute break every now and then. And I am back refreshed, invigorated and really looking forward to 2024. Uh, I hope you are too. Uh, there's a lot going going to be happening in 2024. There's a lot to look forward to both on this channel and also in terms of books, TV shows that we can all look forward to. We'll touch on a few of them, uh, I'm sure, a little bit later in this stream. Um, but this is an open q and um, I just thought I'd start the year with just letting anyone ask the questions that they want about any of the different uh, fandoms, worlds uh, that we cover here on this channel. I did want to start off, though, just very quickly by showing you this. This is um uh thank you uh just before christmas every year just before christmas i do my christmas charity live stream this time it was in aid of uh, crisis at christmas which is a homelessness charity they do fantastic work um for those who are homeless at this time of year um not just giving them shelter overnight, some food to eat, things like that, but helping them on the path towards making sure that homelessness is a thing of the past for those people. So what we raised here uh, just before Christmas, um, I rounded it up to a £1,000, which is, I think, something along the lines of £1,000. $200, $1,300. Fantastic work. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you donated, uh, please know that um, you have helped change someone's life. You have literally given somebody the chance to, to put something horrific behind them and have a little bit of hope for the future. And I think that's a fantastic way to uh, to start the new year. So thank you very much. Um, we will be doing more charity live streams through this year as well. Um, so that's something to look forward to. Right. Uh, but what uh, we'll do today, this, as I say, this is an open q and I've got... Um, lots of questions from uh, my patrons. Um, I'll work my way through them. I will try to get to as much as I can in the chat as well. Um, very broadly speaking, I'll start off with uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones World, then we'll move on to Lord of the Rings, then we'll sort of end with other things. So we'll cover all of the bases. Uh, we might dot around a little bit, uh, but that is the plan. So um, let's start off with um question from uh, da, 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 uh, Johnny Targ saying, Hola Robert, happy new year. Happy new year to you too. What are you most looking forward to in season two of House of the Dragon? And keep up the great work, moderators. I deliberately put this one first because I wanted to remind myself to do an early thank you to the moderators. You do amazing work, moderators. If you are there in the chat already, please show them a little bit of New Year love. They do fantastic work. Um, and uh, Mara Lee also asking, what am I most looking forward to in uh, season two of House of the Dragon? And what episode do you think will be the most disturbing or shocking? Do you think it will be the blood and cheese episode? Um, well, uh, in terms of what am I most looking forward to, um, I, I think, if I'm honest, because I'm the nerd I am, I'm, I'm looking forward to the thing I'm not expecting, uh, the bit of lore that they're going to drop, because they will do this, the, the, absolutely. The Season one, we had the big reveal, which was sort of effectively came from George R. R. Martin, about Aegon's dream and the fact that this drove the Targaryens to um, uh, invade Westeros and it being passed down generation to generation. This was what the Song of Ice and Fire is. All of that stuff, plus a few bits about dragon law, plus there was uh, some random things from Viserys telling us about uh, old Valyria. They will give us some more of this juicy law, I am absolutely sure. I don't know what, I don't know when, I don't know how, but that, I think, is the thing I'm most looking forward to. 
perhaps it will be in the north when uh, Jace heads up to north and goes uh, up to north and goes to Winterfell. Maybe that's where they'll drop it in. I don't know. But that's the thing I'm most looking forward to. Um, other stuff, though, um, dragons. We will see more dragons this time around, and we will learn more about dragons. We'll see Sunfire, for example. I'm really looking forward to seeing Sunfire, the dragon seeds. Um, uh, Blood and Cheese as a single incident, and yes, I think this will be. For those who have not read the book, this will be the single most... Um, arresting, shocking thing that um, happens in the season. Uh, it'll it'll happen quite early, episode one or two. I haven't seen, I have no inside information on this. Uh, I haven't seen a list of what's happening when, but it should happen quite early on in the season. So we will be starting with uh, a bang, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's where I'm what I'm looking forward to. Uh, reflective rambling. Hi there. Good to see you saying red wedding moment of the series. Absolutely. Um, Steve Ash, learner Turner in the chat did a super chat just before we went live saying a bad joke for the stream. Thank you very much for providing this. How many elephants can you fit in a mini? Depends on how good your blender is. I will just leave that on hanging. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, let's go to, um, to lots of people reacting about blood and cheese. Definitely. Derry's read it before saying blood and cheese is going to be the red wedding moment for readers, uh, taking their show only friends through it. Um, uh, we net saying George got me more excited when he talked about the first two episodes yet. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing. George or Martin, he's done a couple of blood blog posts recently we will definitely pick up and talk about uh, them um i've got a question about the sea snake uh, nine voyages thing so we will come back to that in a moment but he when he was over in november he was over in london for a couple of weeks uh, and he visited the studios which are just outside london and um he was shown the first cut of season of episodes one and two and He's always, and he admits that he's biased, and he's always complimentary about uh, House of the Dragon and when he sees cuts, but he did seem very clear and strong on this one. He did really like it, and I think that, uh, yeah, that adds to my own excitement as well. Um, okay. Uh, oh, interesting question. I've just noticed in the chat, Isabel Torian saying, Hello, Robert. Do you think Winterfell Castle will look different closer to the book one maybe on house of the dragon than it did in game of thrones um this this touches on how they're handling um the visuals as well as the law within the different tv shows george R. R. martin has said it was actually it was in his interview with history of westeros a year 18 months ago whenever it was which i still hold up as as a really not just because they're friends of mine but um a really really important interview and in helping understand his approach to the, the tv shows and the books in terms of law and he said that he saw himself as having two roles one of which was to try and keep the tv shows as close to the book law as possible it could never be exactly the same but as close as possible but also the tv shows as close as possible to each other which I interpret in this instance as meaning we're going to see the same Winterfell. Um, that does not mean they're not going to make some changes. It It's very noticeable that uh, in House of the Dragon, they tried to make a couple of changes that they could still do in world, but would draw us slightly closer to the world of the books. The obvious one is the Iron Throne. The Iron Throne that they had in Game of Thrones, iconic imagery, uh, everybody recognised it. They felt that they could not therefore change it for House of the Dragon. However, they did add in, if you remember, the stairs have got the, uh, the swords coming out from them, which gave it a feel a lot a lot more sort of halfway between the the original TV show version and what the book version is. They've got that famous Mark Simonetti picture um, of uh, the uh, the Iron Throne. Um, 
that George R. R. Martin has said, yes, that's it. That's what the Iron Throne is supposed to look like. Um, so I do wonder whether they might um, give us a few more bits, things that they can slightly change without changing the overall feel of what the TV show Winterfell looks like. So it might well be that there'll be areas that they just showed us bits of, they'll show us more of in a way that feels more close to the books. For example, and I've no, no idea whether this is the case, but I think it might be quite cool if they built on the crypts, Winterfell crypts. They showed us a bit of that on the TV show, but I think they could show us a lot more if they wanted to uh, in House of the Dragon. Uh, and similarly, a lot of the buildings that you've got there, we only saw some bits of Winterfell. They could show us some other, uh, like the old keep and things like that. They, they could show us those. Um, okay, let's go to... Um, question from Andrew K. Hi there, Andrew, saying, actually, I don't, I don't see an appetite to massively upend the continuity from Game of Thrones that much thus far from HBO or Condal. Yeah, it's in their best interest for non-book nerds uh, to keep the um, continuity of visuals quite strong between Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon. Um, Jay saying, Happy New Year. Do you expect to see any early rumblings of the Shepherd plot this season of House of the Dragon? Do you think the show may shine a light on his corpse-like characteristics, uh, maybe indicating he is some kind of white? Thanks. Okay, so this is interesting. So I'll start by, for anyone new who has not come across the channel or hasn't heard me talking about TV show and book, the spoiler policy. Spoiler policy on this channel is book spoilers are absolutely fine. Uh, the books have been around for a while. I will happily talk about what happens in the books. Uh, show spoilers uh, for TV show that has not yet happened are not okay. Now, I don't get spoilers. I don't look for spoilers, um, uh, but I will not be giving spoilers out for, uh, for the TV show. Obviously, if I'm saying what's happened in the books, that's probably roughly what's going to happen on the TV show, but they have changed a few things around. So that's the kind of the spoiler policy. So the shepherd, the shepherd is a character who appears um, later on in the narrative of the dance of the dragons. Uh, he is this uh, sort of preacher, rabble rousing preacher. And he is the person who incites the crowd, the masses of King's Landing ultimately to be storming the dragon pit and killing dragons. Now, this happens right at the end of Rhaenyra's time ruling King's Landing. Uh, so it's not ha that's not happening in season two, almost certainly. Um, that said, might we see um, a few? Well, first of all, actually, you did ask specifically about the... Um, uh, the corpse-like characteristics. If if that kind of catches you off guard, this I've I've got the quote here from Fire and Blood, um, which is where this comes from. He is described as a barefoot scarecrow of a man in a hair shirt and rough spun breeches, filthy and unwashed, and smelling of the sty, with a begging bowl hung round his neck on a leather thong. A thief he had been, for where his right hand should have been was only a stump covered by ragged leather. Grand Maester Munken suggests he might have been a poor fellow, though that order had long been outlawed. Where he came from, we cannot know. Even his name is lost to history. Those who heard him preach, like those who would later record his infamy, knew him only as the Shepherd. Mushroom names him the Dead Shepherd. He claims the man was as pale and foul as a corpse fresh risen from its grave. So a, a few other sort of descriptions later. Um, we don't really get much advance on that. Just mushroom and feel free to give as much or as little credence to mushrooms uh, thoughts on the matter as you wish. Mushroom compared him to a corpse. Does this mean he was? actually a corpse, uh, a white in some way? Probably not. Might they go down that route on the show? Probably not. Could they? 
yeah. It, they're more likely, I think, just to leave it a little bit hinted, a little bit vague as it is here in the book. This would be a massive shift if he actually was some kind of white. Now, that said, he is a very important character. They will have to make him stand out in some way. So, um, the main part of this question, though, is are we going to see some of the seeds of this sown in this season? And I think the answer is yes. And I think the, the bigger answer is we've already seen them sown. Now, the, the shepherd was successful in getting the people of King's Landing on his side because for a long period of time, the Targaryens had not just been ignoring them, but they'd been... Um, uh, just basically abusing the small folk. They'd been trying to extract money from them. They, they'd been stopping food getting to them. They, this was a riot waiting to happen. Now, uh, what we have already seen, even in season one, we've seen them planting the seeds for this potential discontent amongst the small folk. I'll draw your attention to two specific things. Firstly, you remember the episode where Damon takes Rhaenyra, young Rhaenyra, down into Flea Bottom just to sort of walk around. He obviously had other things in mind as well, but to walk around and just experience King's Landing. And they have a conversation there in which uh, he says, as a, as a, he says two slightly conflicting things. First of all, he says, as a Targaryen, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but then he also says, don't ignore the small folk. You have to, if you're ruling them, you have to be aware of, of what's going on with them. Um, and she, Rhaenyra, doesn't really seem to take this on board. So that's the first key point. Um, because in the book, it all starts going wrong for Rhaenyra when uh, Damon heads off. He's gone. He's out of there. And she's ruling on her own. So perhaps they're going to say, without him sort of saying, you need to pay attention to the small folk, perhaps she's going to be not paying any attention to the small folk. The second thing, uh, a bit of foreshadowing maybe, is they they included it was quite controversial if you remember within the fan community at the time but during the scene in the dragon pit when aegon the second is being crowned rainis comes up um on on her dragon up through the floor of the dragon pit everyone was like oh that's not in the book that's not in the book she could have ended it she could have killed them all there she decides to fly off the bit which perhaps went slightly under the radar was that this dragon burst up through the floor. Almost certainly dozens of people were, if not killed, then hugely injured. No, none of the Targaryens paid the slightest bit of attention to that. And they had been, the, the small folk had been herded into this small place and been killed by the Targaryens who didn't care. They simply did not care. And if you look at the scene just as everybody's being pushed into the dragon pit, they do, and I'm sure this was deliberate, they had, they showed somebody driving some sheep across, starting this feeling of the shepherd. Um, so they've already sown the seeds in season one. In season two, I think we're going to get more of this. We're going to actually see, and there's, there's a few instances in the book where the people start to get um, upset, disgruntled, when they suddenly realise that there's going to be a war happening, uh, when uh, they they think dragons are going to be attacking, um, they want to leave, the Targaryens shut the gates, uh, food it starts to get a bit of a problem. You saw it. I did a breakdown of the, the first teaser trailer at some point before Christmas, um, and I showed a couple of images that were in the teaser trailer of the small folk of King's Landing just running around in panic. Now, it, there could have been a few different moments in, in season two where that could happen. 
but this is building up. The small folk are being ignored. Uh, so yes, we, we probably won't see the shepherd himself in season two, but we will see the upswell of public opinion against the Targaryens and not just an upswell of public opinion, but anger, resentment, a desire to, if only they could do something to get rid of the Targaryens who are treating them so poorly. Um, so yes, is the short answer. We will see uh, some building up to that. Um, question from Martin S. Hi there, Martin, saying, hello, Robert. Happy New Year. And to you. Uh, no champagne for me this New Year's Eve. Um, how does it feel to have the same first name as the king upon the Iron Throne at the start of A Song of Ice and Fire? I don't really think about it all that much. I also uh, share a name, I guess, with um, King of the North. So, um, yeah, it's, it's only weird when people are uh, talking uh disparagingly about robert um uh on if i'm on a stream with someone else that that's the only time it gets a bit distracting um right let's go to a question from Alhad saying, Happy New Year, Robert. Looking forward to 2024. Me too. Um, in A Feast for Crows, it is revealed that Marjorie is not a virgin. Do you think that would have any further implications for the story, or is it just a one-off thing? Um, so this is, this is an important plot point, because um, they... Marjorie being a maiden, as they say, is is a point which is consistently made um, by House Tyrell. Uh, they say she is a maiden. She never consummated her marriage to Renly. Um, she never consummated her marriage to um, Joffrey, and so she is still a maiden waiting for Tommen uh, to grow older. This is important because the king must marry a maiden in those days. Um, now, that is therefore an important plank in the legitimacy of her being the queen. And it's something that Cersei tries to undermine. So in A Feast for Crows, um, she starts to get more and more paranoid and she starts to and, and a dance with dragons we see this um because uh, the, the two if you've not read the books those last two books happen at the same time they're just following slightly different um uh, storylines and characters but she um starts to see marjorie as a threat a massive threat marjorie is popular with the small folk. Marjorie is winning the favour of Tommen. Marjorie is becoming the most influential woman in court. Cersei is getting older. Uh, Cersei is feeling more and more sidelined. Um, and so she tries to think of ways to basically get rid of Marjorie. And one of the ways is that she comes up with that she starts asking questions now is she is she really a maiden um uh, and uh then she starts to um she tells one of one of her uh white cloaks you know you go and you make up a lie that that you slept with her uh, she tries to get her in trouble with uh the sparrows basically and and this is very based in for lovers of history. This is very based on the kinds of things that happened to Anne Boleyn, um, the second wife of Henry VIII, uh, in that she gets accused not just of oh you had an affair with somebody, but these huge ludicrous um, kind of stories about um, she's having orgies left right and center this is happening over here she's doing that over there it's it's uh, she, uh, she's woman of the loosest morals um and and they th throw enough of this mud at her some of it sticks and marjorie does get caught up in this and get caught uh basically arrested by the high sparrow who cersei has empowered now in this uh she is trying to make her case and there's um 
Sister Moel, who has some of the role, if you remember, Sister Unella, who was played by Hannah Waddingham, Waddingham um, uh, in the TV show. Uh, basically, although Sister Unella is there, um, they sort of, the TV show character was a combination of her and Sister Moel, who, uh, and Sister Moel is, is quite the um, true believer, let's put it that way. And she is there, when Cersei is there in prison, she visits her first thing in the morning and basically says, repent, admit all your sins, you have to do this, you have, and it's like there's no question of, well, maybe she didn't, maybe Cersei needs a fair trial. No, there's a presumption of guilt. Sister Morel is the one who says that she um, uh, examined uh, Marjorie and and she's not a maiden. So um, given all of this, should we believe it? I don't think there's any reason why we should necessarily believe it. Does that mean that Marjorie isn't a maiden? No, we, we simply do not know. Um, and that's not actually the plot important point. The plot important point is that it, she has been accused of it and it has no way of proving her innocence on that point. So, um, uh, will that have any further implications? I don't think so. I think it's played its important part right now. Um, so uh, I don't think it'll have a, a big role going forward. Um, now, if that falls through, we're suddenly left with this issue of what does Cersei do next? If her cunning first cunning plan doesn't work, what does Cersei do next? Well, we know what she did on the TV show. Is she going to do something as dramatic as that in the books? Very probably. Um, uh, Agreed to Weirwood uh, saying uh, first wife uh, oh, this is talking a historical thing here. This is Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine's marriage to Arthur was a big part of the divorce. Yeah, so this is interesting. So um, we, we nearly had, the, England nearly had a, an actual King Arthur. Um, uh, this was Henry VIII's older brother, I believe, um, who had been married to um, uh, Catherine of Aragon. But then uh, that he died young. And uh, I'm sure there are historians who could say, tell a much better tale of, of these lines, but he died young. But politically, that meant that Henry had to marry his brother's widow. And the question of her maidenhood or not was, was a, a big part there. So, yes, this, this was a significant issue there um, at that time. Um, Reflective rambling, uh, picking up a question for Alec Harris. Thank you. I know you do this a lot, but thank you very much for picking up questions for other people. I can't, the amount of things which go through in the chat, I can't stop and see everything. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, turning them into super chats, it's a lot easier to spot them. So thank you. Alec Harris, why didn't the Starks and Martells ever ally when the war broke out? They both have a good revenge motive to take down the Lannisters. Um, so if this is the War of the Five Kings we're talking about, um, I mean, geography is a big first point, uh, that the, the Martells are um, right at the south, Starks are right at the north. They've never historically had uh, much contact at all, so they're not who you would immediately, neither would see the other as obvious or immediate allies. Um, in terms of the Martells, I mean, we, we often think about these things from the Starks perspective, but in terms of the Martells, why weren't they allying with the Starks? Well, I think they probably would do in the longer term, but Doran Martell, his cunning plan, yes, kill the Lannisters, but also he's wanting to marry the Targaryens. He has three different goes at marrying the Targaryens. So um, that's the the grand plan. I if if it had got to um, 
a position where the Martells had actually actively gone to war, which they didn't during the War of the Five Kings, then yes, they would go to war against the Lannisters and they would have found themselves at, at least in a kind of a proxy alliance with the Starks. Um, it's just that they didn't go to war. So they were staying um, uh, at... Um, effectively neutral and so when rob stark is having his thoughts about who is it who shall i try and ally with he's thinking uh, who who do i need to ally he's so he sent uh theon obviously over to the iron islands thinking he had a bit of leverage there he sent cat down uh to um uh, treat with uh stannis and renly um he thought maybe that might work but it didn't really ever cross his mind with the Martells because they weren't engaged in the battle at that point. Um, Nate Davis saying, Happy New Year's, and to you too. Do you think John will be temporarily whited? If so, how will the good guys get him back? Um, well, this is uh, an interesting one. Temporarily whited. Uh, the the working assumption that I and many others have is that John, when his when he's killed, when his body is stabbed, he his spirit leaves and goes into ghost, and it, when he comes back, it'll be his spirit, his soul, whatever it is, going from ghost back into his body. And in the meantime, if you read that last John chapter, you will find that there's a lot of talk about the ice cells. What do we do with bodies? Do we, uh, how do we make sure that they don't come back? People say we should probably burn bodies, but then people say, well, we put some bodies in the ice cells. What happens to them? They go and have a look and no, they're okay. They haven't. Come. So the clear implication is that if you, they will put his body into the ice cells. So in that case, no, I don't think that from what we've seen so far, we're going to see John's body being whited while he, uh, white while he's not in it. That said, there is something that George R. Martin said, I don't know, five years ago now? Um, this was maybe even more. Um, this was, I think, before season eight, maybe, um, in an interview with someone like Time magazine. And he talk, he's talking about Beric Dondarrion. And he says, Beric Dondarrion is a fire white. This is him introducing this concept of you, the, the whites that we talk about. The White Walkers whites are ice whites. Beric Dondarrion is a fire white. He talks about what Beric's experience is as a fire white. And then he says that this is to lay the groundwork the foreshadowing is as it were for john snow so the the clear if we leave aside the what now seems very obvious but the clear implication there was that yes in the books he's going to come back as well he was sort of talking about the tv show and merging it with what he did in the books now that's interesting because that seems to imply that john therefore will be in some way a fire white. Now, what do we know about Beric? So Beric as a fire white is very different to an ice white. The ice white, it would appear, their, um, their spiritual soul has gone, departed, and then they are being controlled in some way by the others. The fire white, that person is still there. Now, they have lost a part of who they are, maybe a large part of who they are. Beric's story is really quite sad when you dig into it. He's there, he talks about all the things he's forgotten. He's forgotten the the name of the woman that he was engaged to, what she looks like. He's forgotten um, uh, a lot about his childhood, his youth, what he used to enjoy. He's lost huge parts of who he is. 
but he is still him and the things which were driving him still driving him um the ice whites they have a complete new set of drivers there is a part of them is still in there it would appear but um it, it, it's a matter of control so i think we will see john not whited in the sense that we might understand his body as being made an ice white but uh something in the manner of him coming back will make him be like Beric, like Fire White. Um, uh, da, 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 da. So good question. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was uh, Nate. Uh, let's see, Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara. Great to see you saying Happy New Year. Thank you for all the great content, merch, and stories. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you, Mara. I hugely appreciate uh, your support um, uh, all through last year and starting this year again. Thank you very much. Um, Martin S., do you think, uh, this is a Lord of the Rings question, do you think that if the Valar captured a Nazgul, do you think they could turn him back into a man reversing the wraithing effect? I believe not. Well, I think the first point is that they wouldn't capture Nazgul because the Valar have distanced themselves from Middle-earth. By the time we get to the Third Age, the Second and Third Ages, they distance themselves from Middle-earth. So that's the first point. Would they have the power um, to sort of undo what, the, um, what Sauron did? Uh, I think I mean, my my take is yes. Uh, they are definitely more powerful than what Sauron has wrought. Uh, Sauron is a Maya, which is one step of power below the Valar. So I think if Manwe wanted to, he definitely could. Uh, but I don't think that they would. Uh, James Boris uh, saying, speaking of the others, do we get any hints about their perspective, their goals, their reasons for attacking? Uh, would be odd for them to be a mon monolithic evil. Yes, so um, it would be odd. And George R. R. Martin has hinted more than hinted on several occasions that they aren't just like basically what we saw on uh, the TV show, which is uh, a group of baddies with no real intent other than to dominate and take over and kill humans and turn them into whites. That's not their their primary motivation, motivator. Um, so uh, what do we know? Not much is the short answer. Um, uh, sadly, we we see them only two or three times in the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire. We, we see them, obviously, in the prologue, first of all. Um, then we see them again uh, a couple of times when the Night's Watch head north of the wall. Um, uh, then um, uh, sort of hints as well. So Varamir certainly sees... Um, the uh, 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 whites, uh, the whites coming, but beyond that, we're just trying to pick through the details of what we see them do. the The fact that they make patterns out of uh, the dead, ever the artists, says Mance Raider, um, seems to imply there's something more going on that again they did not explore on the TV show. Um, we don't, the, the short answer is we don't yet have that information in the book. We can speculate, we can absolutely speculate. I have done several times before. Um, but that's speculating based on not much information. What we do know is they seem to have their own language. They seem to be intelligent. They seem to have, although George R. R. Martin didn't like the word when it was put to him, they seem to have their own civilization in a way. Uh, they can make their own weapons um, in a different way to how humans make their weapons. Uh, they find some things funny. Um, they clearly you know, have some appreciation of art if that's the right way of saying it um they 
clearly are quite strategic in the way that they think and the way that they're deploying their whites. Um, so there's stuff going on there. They're not just this, like, let's go that way and just kill lots of people. There is definitely something going on, but we do not, the honest answer is we do not yet have all of the information. We can speculate, but that's the limit. Uh, Kars Ballerina uh, saying, a Lord Dustin signed the pink letter. Who is he, and does this have something to do with the theory that Lady Dustin secretly helped Mance with the letter? Um, so, my theory, I've done a video on the pink letter. I'll, I'll, I'll redo that, actually, quite soon, I think, as part of... Uh, I, I've got a sort of an on-and-off series, I don't know whether you spotted, of videos that I'm doing um, some with uh, History of Westeros about the plotline in the north um and so we've re we've nearly reached we've already started looking at things like rob's will um and i've got a stannis video coming out tomorrow actually um randomly um but uh, we're going to be look moving forward to try and really unpick what is happening currently with the sort of the great northern conspiracy and where that all might lead in the end uh, but the pink letter, I've already done a video and I will redo that, I think, with a few more recent thoughts. My take, I think, very strongly is this is Mance Raider has written it pretending to be Ramsay Bolton. Um, I think that he is doing this on behalf of Melisandre. I've done, as I say, if you want the whole details about why that is, please do go and uh, take a look at that video. Um, might Lady Dustin be working with him in this? I don't. I don't see that um, immediately. Um, she does seem to be uh, not as loyal to the Boltons as she pretends to be, uh, but she's definitely anti Ned Stark. Um, uh, the clear hint, and then this is Barbara Dustin is a fantastic character because when you dig into um, the the characterization, it's really quite deep and sad. When she she gets Theon to show her the Winterfell crypts because she's no idea where they are. The snow has come down so far. The entrance to the crypts has been snowed over and it takes half an hour for her men to get rid of all the snow and actually get to the entrance um, and then she gets him to go down to show her where the Ned Stark script is basically she wants to make sure that Ned Stark's bones have not already arrived in Winterfell but while she's there she has this sort of heart to heart with Theon which is a bit of a digression on Barbie Dustin, but it's, I was reading it uh, relatively recently. It's a fascinating one. And basically he's there, you know, why do you hate the Stark so much? And she's there for the same reason as you. You wanted to be a Stark. She wanted to be a Stark. She wanted to marry Brandon Stark. And... Uh, that was taken away from her. Then this idea, maybe she could marry Ned Stark instead. That idea was taken away from her. Uh, she marries someone else who seems like he was probably a decent enough guy, but she wanted to be a Stark, and that was taken away. And then the Starks, Ned Stark, did her a huge dishonor uh, by not bringing the bones of her husband back with him. And so she hates them more than she would otherwise for that slight because she desperately wanted to be a Stark. And that creates this parallel with Theon, who he, his anger against the Starks was exacerbated by the fact that he was brought up and he, he actually, he wanted to be in the family, but always was being reminded that he's not a bit like John. Um, the parallels sort of rebound across a whole load of places. But yeah, so it, she, her primary motivation seems to be trying to make sure Ned's 
bones don't get there but also she is one of and we'll talk about this in one of the videos i've got she is very clearly one of the snowman statues uh which seem to be being made to show who is on side when the battle comes who is part of team north um the the question is whether Mance Raider has made contact with Team North within Winterfell or whether he's running a solo mission. If he's running a solo mission, then uh, no, I don't think that's Barbary Dustin uh, on side. Um, Mark Sheese is saying, a short what if, if you please. What would have happened if Beric hadn't given his last life to Cat? I don't know if I could do that as a short what if. Um, uh, she, uh, we, we wouldn't have Barbary Dustin running around. We would have, uh, sort of Barbary Dustin. We wouldn't have Lady Stoneheart running around in the Riverlands getting exacting revenge. We would have Beric Dondarrion, who is... He's not a perfect person by any stretch of the imagination, but he is trying to do right. So we're going to see, we would see fewer um, arbitrary killings and hangings of phrase and more just killings of phrase, if that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, I think that the outcome may well have been the same, but uh, I think we will see more of an impact of Lady Stoneheart in the next book than we have done in so far. Chelsea Oliver. Hi, Robert. I'd be fascinated to know your opinion on who, if anyone, won the Dance of the Dragons, Aegon and Sunfire, Rhaenyra um, uh, as it's her bloodline that carries on, or no one as it's just scared children left at the end? Well, I think you're right on the last point. The, the, the answer, the only correct answer is everyone lost the Dance of the Dragons. House Targaryen lost the Dance of the Dragons because they had dragons, and at the end of it, they did not have dragons. They had a massive family ruling, uh, and everyone was scared of them, and afterwards, they did not. Um, and it wasn't just them. The, the damage done to the continent, to almost all of the noble families, and the small folk in particular, was massive. Everyone lost. And this, I think, is the key point that George R. Martin has made, is that everyone lost uh, the Dance of the Dragons. If you want a sort of a pithy who won, um, Daemon Targaryen. Um, yeah, he was killed, but he died in a manner of his own choosing. And who survived? Again, hashtag spoilers for possibly for the show, but who survived? Um, you see that the two daughters he had from his first marriage survived, and the two sons he had from his second marriage survived. That's who survived. And also Nettles survived, who he seemed to, in whatever capacity that was, form an incredibly strong bond and connection with. So he won. Well, his people were the ones who survived at the end of it. Um, certainly, I mean, Aegon II and Sunfire did to start, I mean, sort of did to start with, but that didn't last long enough. No. Who ruled? Aegon II then who, so Aegon III, who ruled after after him, his two children, who ruled after them, Viserys II. This was um, Team Black. So if, if you had to pick a team that won, and ultimately it was their line that, that passed down, then yeah, it's Team Black, and particularly Damon. But everyone lost. Um, Caius Ballerina, um, is Lord Dustin just a typo by Mance? Does a male Dustin actually exist? Why is she head of the house then? So she is, um, she seems to be head of the house. George R. Martin doesn't go into, sorry, I should clarify this one. Uh, apologies. Yeah, George R. Martin doesn't go into the details of exactly why she seems to be head of the house. Um, the clear implication is that there's no heir. Uh, they certainly weren't married for long enough. She didn't get pregnant, so there was no... Uh, there, so she seems to be ruling. Um, and um, who 
would take over after her, we're, we're not told. In terms of um, Lord Dustin, I would have to go and reread the exact text again to sort of answer the specifics there. But the 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 Mance thing, if Mance Raider did indeed write that letter, then um, you would expect that it perhaps might not know all of the, he might not know all of the details of everything which was going on. He might think that if there's a Lady Dustin, there must be a Lord Dustin. Uh, maybe there's uh, an agreed bit of language with uh, Melisandre, say, if this was what worked out, this you will know this is from me because I will mention a dead person's name or, or something along those lines. Um, so uh, the pink letter is I think very clearly not from Ramsey. Um, and so you then have to look, you have to look with a critical eye upon everything that's in there and not just accept this as being the truth. Um, mm -mm. Okay, is that me caught up in the chat? Um, Yeah, I think that's for the time being. Let's go to a question from, um, where are we at? Uh, well, I've got three questions coming different angles, looking at Dunk and Egg at Summerhall. So uh, let's take these, these three one at a time. Uh, Jahan saying, hello, Robert, you've discussed before how Dunk wondering why his foot is worth the life of a crown prince may foreshadow him saving an important person or people at Summerhall. I've seen people theorize he'll save someone like Rayella or Eris. However, throughout the novellas, Dunk is a champion of the small folk rather than the highborn people. Have you considered that he may instead save the servants who must have been save the servants who must have been present at Summerhall? Him <coughs> pardon me. Him um saving servants from one mad Targaryen, Egg would parallel him previously saving the puppet girl from another mad Targaryen, Arian, and I feel it would subvert readers' ideas of who is important. Okay, so for those who do not know uh, this um, theory, I guess it is, um, it starts off in book one, story one, The Hedge Knight for uh, Duncan Egg. Then, and we'll see this next year, incidentally. This is, um, they, they're starting, I said, we'll, we'll pick up randomly through this stream. I'm sure we'll pick up on things that are going on in the next year. They've, um, They've announced they're starting filming Duncan Egg in spring of this year, perhaps as early as March, so maybe even a couple of months' time, which is fantastic news. And I think means that we're going to get Duncan Egg on our screens probably next year, probably 2025. I think probably HBO in the short term at least are thinking they can alternate for a little bit so uh, with House of the Dragon and Duncan Egg, so they always have a bit of Game of Thrones content every year on HBO. So, um, in the Hedge Knight, it, it, the the main plot twist turn is when um, Dunk goes in to save um, Tansel Tutor, who works as a puppeteer, from the attentions of. Aryan bright flame Targaryen, who's a nasty piece of work. And in so doing, he punches and kicks Aryan, and Aryan demands the penalty, which apparently used to be there, that if you if you punch or kick a, a member of the royal family, then you lose the offending part of your body. You would lose your hand, you would lose your foot. Dunk is saved, however. Baylor Breakspear sort of comes to the rescue. Um, Egg intervenes first. Baylor Breakspear suggests, oh, we can have this trial by seven, which perhaps from his perspective wasn't the wisest thing to say, particularly as he dies. Dunk gets exonerated, uh, but Baylor Breakspear, the heir to the Iron Throne, the Crown Prince, dies. And we get this scene... 
towards the end where Dunk is there and he's like sitting under his tree and he's th thinking, my foot, they could have cut off my foot, but they didn't. And instead, in order to save my foot, a crown prince dies. And he's just trying to weigh up the the kind of the equivalence of this. What does this mean? And we get this when he's talking to Makar, uh towards the end. Um, he says, sometimes I sit under that tree there and look at my feet and ask if I couldn't have spared one. How could my foot be worth a prince's life? Mightn't it be that some morrow will come when I'll have need of that foot, when the realm will have need of that foot, even more than a prince's life? Which is a really interesting, just, this is dunk being dunk, just uh, thinking about things, but uh, in a really simple but quite profound way. And he thinks back to this uh, in later stories, he thinks back to this a couple of other times. This is clearly something which is a theme that George R. Martin wants us to think about, his foot. He doesn't think about his hand, he thinks about his foot. How can his foot be worth a prince's life? Is his foot in some way going to help the realm to the equivalent or more than saving a prince's life? Which has led many people, myself included, to theorise that perhaps at the end, we know in the tragedy at Summerhall, egg trying to hatch dragon eggs, uh, huge conflagration, uh, fire everywhere, the whole place burns down, and we get, George R. Martin doesn't give us the detail, of course, uh, he's saving that, I'm sure, for the when he writes the, the final Duncan Egg story, but... Um, Dunk, but for the bravery of the Lord Commander, some, many, a certain person would have died, we read. Um, we don't know the details, but the hint, therefore, if we're looking for some kind of uh, way to balance these things up in the way that Dunk seems to want to balance these things up, then perhaps he uses his foot to save the life of someone. Perhaps he saved, as you said here, many have suggested, perhaps he saves the life of Rayella, um, who at the time is just about to give birth to Rhaegar. And we all know quite how important Rhaegar will become to the plot. So perhaps that is how Dunk's foot at the end of his life actually saves a prince, but also because of Rhaegar's importance, is of even greater importance to the realm than just a random prince much earlier in the story. So that's the background. Having said all that, the, the um, Jahan's proposition is that it would be more in keeping for Dunk to be saving small folk than a, a prince, princess, whoever. And perhaps this is a George R. R. Martin subverting expectations about the importance uh, or what is the importance of the prince of a prince's life. I like this idea. I like this idea a lot. I don't know whether that's how George R. R. Martin is going to do Duncan Egg. Uh, so far, he's written them in a really kind of straightforward way. They're, they're, whether he keeps up with that as... Duncan Egg grow up, I don't know. But in the short term, he certainly seems to be um, writing them less in a less dark way, in a less let's try and subvert tropes way um, than the main series, A Song of Ice and Fire. So I really like the idea, but at the moment, and I'll wait for some more stories, but at the moment, I think I'm still on the bandwagon of he uses this to potentially save Rhaegar. Uh, which brings me to um, the second question related to this same issue, or second angle, uh, which is from Ms. Fox saying, hi, Robert, new patron, and this is my first question. Well, welcome, first of all, to Patreon. Um, if you don't know, I'm sure you picked it up. Uh, one of the patron perks, if you wish to join my Patreon, Support the channel is that every time I do a live stream, I give patrons the chance to ask a question or two um, and get priority. So um, 
Welcome, um, and I'm glad you're using the opportunity to ask your question. Um, with the prophecy, says Miss Fox, with the prophecy and Summer Hall, we largely think of Rhaegar being the result of the tragedy, therefore being the prince that was promised, even though it's not really him. I'm curious if it's just as much Rhaella being saved, possibly by Dunk, uh, so she could go on to have Danny. If the prophecy was contingent on Rhaegar's line surviving, then Rayella wasn't as important. I feel her role is often reduced when we think of the prophecy, uh, but she is either the grandmother, John, or the mother of the prince, prince or princess that was promised. And that means her survival at Summerhall was integral, perhaps even more so than Rhaegar, if Danny is the prince that was promised. Do you think we focus too much on Rhaegar's birth or survival? So I think this is a fantastic uh, um, different perspective on this. And I think you're right that we do instinctively, because of the way the story is being written, we instinctively think about this being about Rhaegar. Let me start with the why it's set up for this to for us to think about this being about Rhaegar. Um, and it's set up because um, we're told that the point of Summer Hall was that Egg wanted to birth a dragon. And uh, what do you need to birth a dragon? Well, he thinks you need fire. You also, we think we need blood, sacrifice. And so we get the sacrifice of at least three hugely important people. We get Egg. Aegon V himself, his son Duncan Targaryen, who was heir to the throne for a long time, and also Sir Duncan the Tall, who, as we've already established, he is quite important because he has saved the life, or a crown prince gave his life to save Dunk. So we've got three sacrifices, we've got blood, we've got fire, a desire to give birth to dragons, a dragon egg, and we have a Targaryen being born. The imagery there is deliberate by George R. R. Martin for us to be saying the draw, the prophetic conclusion that Rhaegar is important. Um, and he is the sort of the um, symbolic dragon being born as a result of, of what uh, Egg was doing. Uh, added to which we have the echo with Danny. Um, where Danny has fire, she has blood, she has three very important dead people, powerful dead people as sacrifices, and dragons are born. And the echo is deliberate there. So George R. Martin is very much trying to give us this um, literary nudge push towards thinking that the important point here is Rhaegar being born. But... Um, you are 100% right that this isn't just about, if we're thinking about who is saved, Rayella is is the important one. Eris, obviously, being surviving is important, but Rayella is the important. She is the person who is about to give birth to Rhaegar. Rhaegar, we believe his child will be Jon, um, and Rayella herself will have another child who is Danny, and they are the two big candidates to be the prince that was promised so yes this is a different angle to look at this and i think i would agree with you completely um uh, and the third perspective on um this Jahan again saying hi robert from what i know egg is thought to have died from the flames at summer hall do you think it's likely or possible that dunk may have actually been responsible for his death it would be ironic if a crown prince died to save Dunk so that he could later kill a king. This would be similar to how Jamie killed the Mad King to prevent him burning down King's Landing. However, unlike Jamie, Dunk seemingly failed to prevent the disaster. Perhaps he couldn't bring himself to kill Egg and the tragedy at Summerhall was the result. So we know so little about this. Again, another really interesting possible perspective. Might Dunk have actually tried to kill Egg because he realised... From what we can see, Egg gets increasingly focused on hatching dragon eggs to the point of danger. I mean, this is 
with the best will in the world, and we obviously love Egg at the moment in the stories we've seen, but the best will in the world, getting a whole load of wildfire, getting some pyromancers together, uh, it's a it's a pretty risky mix, it has to be said. He is deliberately trying to get fire with wildfire in order to try and create dragons. <coughs> so this is this is high risk stuff. Might Dunk have tried to stop him? Might the end of the Dunk and Egg story being Dunk, who has been there protecting Egg all this time, finally having to turn on Egg? It's perhaps. I don't think we have any clues to say that is what's going to happen. The only thing we have from the world of ice and fire is a few sentences with the equivalent of the flames grew out of control and then dot 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 died but for the valor of the lord commander so dunk definitely saves some people but we don't know maybe he did i don't like the idea i will have to i don't like the idea but that's because i like the characters um but uh, i mean there is no doubt that george r martin has had this theme of you killing the person you love um that is there through you know, zora high legend and things like that so perhaps uh so let's go to the chat let's go to uh, raven's oath the shine maid crossing the bridge of dreams twice is crazy magical how and why did George R. R. Martin write this? A random bridge, the most magical place for a reason. Okay, so this is um, uh, Dance with the Dragons. Tyrion is on the Shy Mate. He's there with Young Griff, Fagon, um, Old Griff, all the gang are there. And they're going down the River Rhoyne, um, and they pass um, uh, through what was Troy Rain, which was the capital of uh, the Roynish civilization. And this is a um, now a really misty, magical place. It's all in ruins. The Valyrians destroyed it, but in so doing, I won't give you the whole story, um, but in so doing, um, uh, the there was some pretty mighty water magic, which destroyed a whole load of the Valyrians and left the remains of Troy Rain as the kind of place you just want to um, avoid. And it, it is now where stone men, people who have got grayscale, go or are taken basically to die, to turn into statues. And so the show made this boat is going passing down through this ancient civilization, the mists are there, hard to see things. They come to the Bridge of Sighs, um, and Bridge of Dreams, sorry, Bridge of Sighs is in, <laughs> in Venice, um, the Bridge of Dreams, and they pass by it. It's noticeable, it's like this triple decker bridge, so it's, it's noticeable. Um, then, Tyrion goes, hang on a minute, we're coming up to it again. What's what's going on here? Um, after which they get jumped by some stone men, basically. Um, and this is where Tyrion gets sort of dragged into water. We get um, John Connington contracts grayscale there. A lot goes on, but they escape and they get through to the other side. Now, this has led to a lot of um, questions and thoughts within the community. What exactly happened there? Now, one completely random but fascinating uh, side issue here is that there was another chapter. When George R. Martin re wrote this originally, he, he wrote another Tyrion chapter based here. And he so they didn't just immediately had managed to get out and escape to the other side um uh they, they they got stuck for a bit Tyrion got stuck there for a bit and the 
the reason why he decided not to include that chapter is because he said this took Tyrion down too magical a path. It didn't fit right in the rest of the narrative. Uh, his path, he starts off very not believing in uh, in any vaguely magical thing to start with. And eventually he comes to, uh, obviously, at the end of Dance with Dragons, he's there seeing the dragons. So by the beginning of uh, The Winds of Winter, he's there seeing the dragons in the sky overhead. Um, so he, George R. Martin felt that this disrupted the character flow of, of Tyrion. However, he has written this, and he, he liked the chapter, and he put it in his desk drawer, and he said, uh, so that's not, not as long as I'm alive, no one's reading that. Leaving the, the potential that, you know, maybe at some point we might get to read that chapter, which would be absolutely fascinating. So the, the important point for us here is that this means that this is a magical place. It's not that George R. R. Martin just like did a with this. There is magic going on here. My take, this isn't, as some have suggested, time travel. They don't go back in time to where they were before and then go through again. They're carrying on the same conversation um, that they were. It's not that they go back and Tyrion going, hang on, didn't we, didn't we say this before? It's just that they're passing by the same place as before. So the magic around that place is water magic. This is the Rhoynish magic was water magic. My take is that they went past and then the stone men or their leader, the Shrouded Lord, um, use water magic to bring them back around. The, the, the waters there are treacherous, there are eddies, the, your, your boat can be moved off in different places. So I think it's simply that they used water magic to bring the boat back around to where it had been, so that it has to go back under the bridge. Why? Because they wanted to attack it. Why didn't they just attack it the first time around? Because as they are going through there, that is when they're talking about Targaryens, basically, and Tyrion's figuring out who young Griff is. And what do we know about uh, the Rhoynish? They hated the target that not just the Targaryens, the Valyrians. And if they suddenly thought, hang on a moment, here's a Valyrian coming through, we're gonna get him. So I think that's what happened. I think that uh they uh, they used water magic, the shrouded lord, the stone men, whoever is there that we don't know the details because we haven't seen that chapter that never got released. Um they brought the boat back around again once they realized who it was who was coming through, and then they attacked. Um, let's go to Cass Ballerina, picking up a question for James Boris. Thank you very much. Saying, I just found your channel a few weeks ago, Robert, and some of the stuff you've opened up my mind to in A Song of Ice and Fire is amazing. Uh, the Howland Ashara theory blew my mind especially. Well, that makes me very happy. Thank you so much uh, for telling me that. Um, yeah, the uh, Howland Ashara is, I, I think, it's one of my favourite working theories of, of what's actually going on behind the scenes. We, I think we will get more on this i hope we will get more on this within the year uh, because another exciting thing happening this year under the radar for many people is the turning at Harren hall stage play this is something again when george R. martin was over in london he met the the main writer main producer uh, he has had an active involvement in the development of this stage play which is what happened at the turning at Harren hall they're going to call it the iron throne not the turning at Harren hall um, but we will almost certainly see more of the plot of what was actually happening there than we've we've had so far. Because what we've had about the Turning Town Hall is just little snippets here and there. This we're actually going to see what happened. Now we should see that George R. Martin. He said, you know, basically hedging, 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 but hoping it might open 
at the end of this year, towards the end of this year, which would which implies that they are nearly finished writing it. And they're just now thinking about production. Um, and then they'll sort of have to get on to sort of booking a theatre, basically, because a lot in, in London, as, as I'm sure, in West End in London, as I'm sure, Broadway as well, a lot of the theatres are booked up years in advance. If you've got a successful show, then it will stay in the same theatre often for years and years and years. Um, the Mousetrap, the Agatha Christie play, has been in the same theatre for, I think, 60 years or so. Um, uh, so actual theatre space is a premium, so they have to find where they're going to do this. Uh, and I, the reason I'm talking about the West End of London is because George R. Martin did talk about it opening in London, uh, which is great for me. <laughs> um, it's it's a, certainly going to be a lot quicker and cheaper for me to get to see that than if it were in New York, say. Um, but uh, I'm hopeful that alongside that, they may release the script so that we can all see it, even if you can't get to see the play it straight away, uh, you can get to see the script. And I think we will get at least some hints about things around the periphery of the action, like a Shara Dane. We should at least see a Shara Dane. We should see Howland Reed, even if they are not the center of whichever story they're wanting to tell in this, we should see those characters. Um, okay. Um, Andrew Kay talking about Harrenhal saying, until told otherwise, I still hold out hope that Egg's obsession was still rooted in good intentions with perhaps some sabotage at work. Um, yeah, I think I'm I'm with you on that one. I in as much as um, uh, we know, Maester Eamon said that his brothers all died because they dreamed of dragons, and so in his mind, and he was close to Egg. Remember, in his mind, that was what caused Egg's death was wanting his ob obsession in some way with hatching dragon eggs um his intention was seemingly good from what we have in the world of ice and fire it seems to be that he felt that he wanted to institute reforms which would help the small folk but the lords of the land wouldn't uh, support that he didn't feel he had the power to impose it um but he thought he would if he had dragons uh so whether you agree with that logic or not that seems to have been what until we hear else, um, yeah. Otherwise, then that seems to be what the the reasoning was behind it all. Um, Skulder Loth saying, "Happy New Year, Robert, and to you. Uh, thank you for the amazing content as usual. Thank you. Uh, question: Have you ever read the Book of the New Sun? If so, uh, what do you feel about it? The Book of the New Sun. Uh, yes, I've got it." just down there in fact um uh i i think it's um uh this is gene wolf for those who haven't uh, read it uh, it's one of the best sci-fi fantasy series out there i think it's astonishing writing um i would highly recommend it uh, to anyone it's a it's a series um uh there's three four books in the Book of the New Sun, and then it follows up with another trilogy, and then a third trilogy, I think, trilogies rather than quartologies, quadrologies, uh, whatever whatever they are, um, uh, then, uh, yeah, it's brilliant, wonderfully written. Uh, the, 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 the delight of Gene Wolfe is not just in the inventiveness of the world, but in the language usage. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, well overdue a proper adaptation, I think. Uh, Martin S., uh, this is a Lord of the Rings question. If Ulmo fought a dragon, would he send an intense stream of water into the mouth of the dragon to put out the flame? Uh, that The imagery alone works for me, Martin, I think. Um, yes, why not? Um, uh, if Ulmo fought a dragon, I think if I were a dragon, I would stay away from Ulmo and I'd stay away from the sea. Um, but yes, that seems like a, a good uh, plan. Rosie Wilson, uh, let's celebrate their first super chat. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Uh, hello, Robert. I wanted to recommend the British Library's exhibition on fantasy objects. Uh, ob 
on fantasy, objects include Gandalf's staff and Arya's needle, 100% worth a visit. Yes, I have been to this. In fact, I should probably share some photos. I took a few photos there. Um, the British Library in London has some fantastic exhibitions sometimes, and the one they've got going on right now is brilliant. If you are close to London, I would highly, highly recommend it. It works, it works through... Um, fantasy literature and has some uh excellent uh exhibits yes it has the the, the staff ian mckellen used uh during um the uh, uh the filming of lord of the rings um it also has some other um lord of the rings uh i mean there's a wonderful um if i had the image here i would show you there's, there's this wonderful the first edition of the Swedish uh, version of The Hobbit, which had um, illustrations. And there's this illustration of Gollum in it, um, which does not look like Gollum. Um, uh, this massive sort of big creature. Um, and Tolkien himself was shown at the exhibition, informs us of this wonderful little bit of history. Tol Tolkien himself saw this um and although he liked the art he thought that's not Gollum. um and for he then made sure that future editions of the hobbit included the descriptor small when talking about Gollum, when describing Gollum, so that no future illustrator would do so anything similar so they've got things like that they've got um c.s lewis's map of narnia uh they've got um uh, michael palin's two pages where he was planning out um monty python and the holy grail um uh so you can see how it all was fitted there, there's so much stuff there that it's just uh there's Ursula Le Guin there. There's, there, there's lots. Um, so yeah, it's if you're a lover of books, if you're a lover of fantasy, then uh, I would highly recommend it. But thank you, uh, Rosie. Um, uh, you're very right in saying that I would, uh, I would like that. I did like that a lot. Um, uh, relax like a cat. Um, uh, one or two, a previous Q and A about Tom Bombadil was so fascinating that I've started reading Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. I'm loving it so far. Currently a few chapters into the Fellowship. Excellent news. Good. Uh, well, you, if you're a few chapters into the Fellowship, then you're going to get on to Tom Bombadil very soon. Um, he's a great character. Uh, absolutely great character. Uh, John Buxton, welcome to Channel Membership. Um, uh, that For those who don't know what Channel Membership is, um, it's uh, if for whatever reason you don't want to go to Patreon, and I'll take this as them, but as we're there uh, talking about it, the best way to support this channel is through Patreon. Um, uh, and there is a link if you're watching back later, there'll be a link down in the description. If you're watching live, I'm sure one of wherever your chat is, I'm sure one of the moderators will put a link across to it. That's the best way to support this channel. If for whatever reason you don't want to go there, uh, channel memberships here on YouTube, uh, you don't get the benefits of being over on Patreon, which are uh, asking the questions, um, uh, early access to stuff, you get all of the audio from my videos, things like that. Um, uh, but if you would like to support the channel, then that is an easy way to do that. Um, and John Buxton, you also, and you, if you're a channel membership, uh, then you get a little star next to your name, uh, which means, again, I'm slightly more likely to be able to notice you Things do go through very quickly in the chat. But I saw you say that the, I think the play has the potential to be amazing. I, I agree absolutely with that. Um, right. Uh, I think that's... Um, uh, oh, actually, Andrew K. interesting Duncan Egg question. Uh, speaking of Duncan Egg, George R. Martin is talking about going back in time or in between the novellas for future installments, so couldn't he just as easily skip to the end? Yeah, this is an interesting idea. I, I've speculated on this in the past as well. He, um, I think it was probably when he was announcing that Duncan Egg, the TV show, was happening, um, he said 
in, in a very way, a way very reminiscent of of how he used to talk about uh, Game of Thrones on the Song of Ice and Fire is, I don't want the TV show to overtake the stories, so I want to get on to writing more Duncan Egg stories, uh, which is great, but he's also said, I'm going to write The Winds of Winter first. Um, I want both. I'm sure we all want both. But he did run down again the state of play in terms of the Duncan Egg stories, which is fascinating. We've had three. Um, there's one more that is half written. He sort of got a bit stuck and left it and then got caught up in writing The Winds of Winter, which has the working title. It won't finish being called this. The working title of The She-Wolves of Winterfell. They go up to Winterfell. There's a... A succession crisis basically in Winterfell and that's the plan there's another one which has got the working title of the village hero which is set, going to be set in the riverlands and egg is resolving some dispute we think between uh, the brackens and the blackwoods and George R. R. Martin said also we should go back and do that bit uh when he was in dawn um when when Duncan Egg were in Dawn, which takes place between the first and second Duncan Egg stories. Now, that's interesting for the reason that Andrew mentions is that this does seem to imply that he's not necessarily just writing these in order, uh, chronological order. He he's if he's willing to jump back and do one from earlier in the timeline, then perhaps he's willing to jump forward and do one from later in the timeline. I don't think he's going to do that. Um, uh, I think that uh, I, as in, I don't think he's going to jump all the way to the end and tell us what happened at the, uh, the tragedy of Summerhall, but and then sort of skip the stuff in the middle. But he could. Um, so I like the idea. Um, I do wonder whether we will get effectively a time jump we've we've had the first three have happened in the space of just a handful of years and the if he's already thinking about doing another one during that time period uh he will have to slow down the pace at which these happen surely um i don't know um uh, in answer to the question yes theoretically he could jump ahead i don't think he's going to Let's go to um, a question from Rassler saying, Hey, Robert, Tywin is often considered a great strategist, but his initial plan is highly questionable. His plan was to lure Ned into a trap and capture him so that he could then use him to trade for Tyrion. The big issue here is at the time Ned is still Hand of the King and Robert is still alive. So to attack Ned and his men is to attack the crown itself. Did Tywin really believe that Robert would do nothing about this, even with the sizable debt that Robert owed Tywin? There's no way he could give Tywin a pass and not respond to this direct attack on the crown without appearing weak and risking further rebellious lords. Um, so uh, what was Tywin thinking here? Did he know that Rob would die or did he truly believe that he would just cave and show the whole realm um, uh, what he was? So um, was Tywin's original plan, did it make sense? This is a question that has been knocking around the community for a while because it's not, it's not as clear as in its strategic mastery as some of the later ones. Yeah, his manipulation to to make the Red Wedding happen, that clearly shows he's he's operating on a different level to people like Rob Stark. Um, but this, it, it all sort of kind of seems to go wrong. You kind of wonder whether he's judged the characters right. I've looked at this over quite a few times, and I think the issue here is not so much the plan, it's the lack of communication. Um, and I'll explain what I mean. So the situation is Tyrion has been captured. And Tywin, in order to keep up his um, sort of tough man act, he cannot allow, he says this, he cannot allow uh, 
one of his children to be kidnapped by somebody else, taken away um, without some kind of you know, retribution. He will not allow the Lannister name to be besmirched like that. He has to do something. So he cannot just sit back. He has to do something. And he clearly judges the Starks or Catelyn Stark well enough to know that she's not just going to give him up. That's not what's going to happen. Um, so he comes to the, I think, reasonably logical conclusion that the best way to do this is some kind of prisoner swap. If he could get hold of Ned, he is undoubtedly right about this, if he could get hold of Ned, then Cat would give up Jamie Lannister in a swap for Ned. No one would be happy, it wouldn't be good, tensions would be high, but Jamie, oh, sorry, Jamie, Tyrion would be returned um, uh, and Ned would go back there. What about Robert Baratheon? Well, Ned's his best friend, absolutely. He's married to a Lannister. Lannisters are basically running the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, he's obviously the titular head, but that's where the power lies. His instinct, as we saw at the crossroads with what happened with um, when Joffrey got bitten by Nymeria, um, his instinct is actually when it comes to the Starks and the Lannisters, when he has Ned Stark against Cersei Lannister, he actually just wants them to stop fighting. He will just say, just sort it out, get some kind of equivalence, and we're done. So I think that Tywin understood the dynamics right there. The question, therefore, is how does he do that? He cannot go in with Lannister forces to capture Ned Stark. That would be a huge provocation. So his cunning plan is I will send troops um, under the leadership of the mountain, namely Lorch, etc., into the Riverlands, not in Lannister uh, colours, but as brigands. And they're going to go around and um, basically commit atrocities in the Riverlands. Um, this is an easy win for him because worst case scenario, if this all does go to war, he is already weakening um, the key ally for the the Starks, the Tullys. House Tully would always ally with the Starks because of Captain Tully. And he is straight away, the first part of this plan, he is weakening a potential future opponent in a war. So that kind of makes sense. Um, but he then thinks again, judging correctly, that Ned Stark would want to, would see through this in some way. Um, Tywin would have plausible deniability because there's never any um, Lannister armor or anything there, but Ned would want to lead a force out to try and take on um, uh, the mountain. Why does he think that Ned's like this? Well, we know what Ned, Ned is the kind of guy who says if you sentence someone to death, you have to do it yourself. He is basically sentencing the mountain to death. He's saying this person needs to be killed. He is going to lead it himself. And he would have done. Ned decides to do this himself, but Jamie then ambushes, ambushes him um, outside Littlefinger's brothel and Ned gets injured and he can't lead the uh, that group himself and so he chooses Beric de off and do it for him still this is a win for the Lannisters because um Ned sends loyal troops out there Ned's uh, strength in King's Landing is diminished even further um but then we get Ned captured and Ned gets killed, ruining the prospect of a prisoner exchange. Tywin gets angry about this, understandably. He thinks that mistakes were made, grievous mistakes were made. Um, but this is not his plan that specifically went awry, because even, the, even if the plan did not work, which it didn't really, he still um, ruined Ned Stark's the strength and power in King's Landing. He's been ruining the Riverlands' strength. Um, he's actually 
building his way up to strengthen his position in a future war. But the issue was not the understanding how people re would react or the tactics. In my view, the issue is the lack of communication. If he had got the message to Jamie quick enough and said, I want Ned Stark, yeah, leave Ned Stark alone. Let Ned Stark come out into the Riverlands and we'll capture him. Or if he had sent a message to Cersei saying, under no circumstances is Ned Stark to be killed, then all of this could have been prevented. It's, it was the lack of communication that was uh, the issue. Um, let's go to... Um, I think I have another question or two in the chat. Um, yep, here we go. John Buxton uh, saying, hi there. Hi, Robert. Happy New Year. And to you. Any thoughts on the disputed lands theory of Duncan being descended from House Strong? Appreciate all the hard work. Um, thank you. Uh, so disputed lands, Amanda, big fan as always. Um, I've not read all of the details of um, that theory. Um Duncan's heritage is, is a fascinating one because he sort of grows up in King's Landing. We don't really know where he's come from. Um, he vaguely remembers his mother, not his father. Um, and yet he's clearly phys a, a physical specimen. He's seven foot high. This is why he's called Sir Duncan at all. He's seven foot high. That's well over two meters for those who work in meters. Um, so he's um, uh, whoever his father was, very probably was somebody who was quite a brawler, quite big, strong, imposing physically. Um, this does work with the idea of this being how strong, uh, because we know what how strong are like. Um, we've seen them, Harwin strong. He was, you know strongest, uh, broadiest fighter there was in the land, basically. Uh, so this kind of works. Um, I've not seen any other evidence that she's put forward. I would have to watch the video, but I, I like it. James Boris, will we ever get a look at Greywater Watch? Maybe after Howland drops the big secrets? It's too fascinating a place to only be background material. Um, well, in order to see it... Um, we would need to um, have a POV character go there, basically. So um, who is going to go there? It's not 100% clear. Um, would, would there be any purpose for them to go there? My, my general take is, yes, it's a fascinating place. So's a shy, never going to go to die. Um, that, so I don't think we necessarily have to go to Greywater Watch. I would like it, but I think at the moment we've got a group of people in Greywater Watch who are going to go north. And I don't, therefore, I don't see immediately why we would see it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would like to, but I can't see a, a plot reason why we would. I think that people will be coming out of uh, Greywater Watch rather than going into it. Adam Smith saying, hi, Robert. Do you think Duncan Egg's POVs will change between Duncan Egg? Uh, P.S. Love you. Well, thank you very much. Um, will they change between Duncan? As in, do you mean, will we get a book from Egg's perspective? Uh, I mean, I find that a fascinating idea. Uh, but my instinct is that we're, it's going to carry on being Dunk uh, as the PAV for the Duncan Egg stories um, because I, he's he's a fascinating character and it works really well and the titles George Martin has previously a long time ago said to the sort of the outline titles that he's thinking of for some of these and they're all about Dunk so the first three stories we've got. The Hedge Knight is a description of what Dunk is like at the time. Um, the Mystery Knight, the Sworn Sword. These, this is 
what Dunk is at at different points in his career. And later on, we'll, we'll get the, the village hero, we'll get uh, the Lord Commander, things like that. So they're describing him as he's going through rather than Egg as he's going through his life. Um, Chris WD23, if you could learn the true answer to any of Song of Ice and Fire mystery right now, what would it be and why? Uh, oh, there's so many. Um, I mean, I, th I think not, well, it's it's got to be the Tower of Joy. I mean, just what happened at the Tower of Joy, if, if I'm allowed something as vague as that, um, I, I, I think we will find out what happened at the Tower of Joy, but um, it's... Uh, there are so many things. What happened with Arthur Dane? Why? Why Arthur Dane didn't kill Ned? Um, why? You know what? Who was there? Uh, what was said? What was the promise me? Um, I th we think we know the answers to most of these things, but we need to nail them down. So yes. Um, Larissa Baker saying thank you, lovely mods. Absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, uh, I think uh, that's um, that's it for the chat for the moment. Um, let's go to Rassler saying, hey, Robert, do you think Harold Westerling will take Stefan Darklin's role from the book or will he play a different role in events? And if so, what could they be? OK, so this is uh, this is interesting. So this is uh, House, House of the Dragon, Fire and Blood, uh, compare and contrast, basically. So um, we have, in Fire and Blood, we have Sir Stephen Darklin, who was a member of the Kingsguard. He goes over to support um, Rhaenyra, um, be becomes made the Lord Commander of her Kingsguard, then decides he wants to uh, try to ride a dragon and dies in the attempt. So... It's that's his storyline. There's a bit more to it, but that's basically it. Um, he does appear in House of the Dragon, but not firstly, not as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, and secondly, not as a major character at all. Instead, we have Harold Westerling, who was played by Graham McTavish, who you will know. Um, uh, he's a uh, well-established actor, particularly in the fantasy worlds. He was um, Dwalin in uh, the Hobbit movies, for example. And um, he's also been in The Witcher. Um, uh, so he's he's well-known, well-respected. They've hired a good actor, which seems to imply that they're not just going to underuse him. Um, Harold Westerling, you may remember in season one of House of the Dragon, he didn't seem very comfortable with what was going on with Team Green. And so almost certainly he is going to be taking over the Stefan Darklin shifting sides and going over to, to Team Black. Will he also go for the uh, trying to tame a dragon and die thing, taking over all of Stefan Darklin's um uh, storyline i mean maybe if they want to show how dangerous dragons can be that would be quite a cool way to do it um but maybe they want to keep him on for another couple of seasons have him as a person alongside um Rhaenyra. um so basically and harold westling sorry i should say in the books he dies i don't know 20 years before he's dead for a long time before we get to the dance of the dragons um, so he's not even alive then. So they've created this character, shifted things around and created this character. I don't know why they chose they did that rather than just make Graham McTavish be a character called Stefan Darklin. You'd have to ask them that. But um, yeah, they basically at least partly merged them. Um, Let's go to Ms. Fox. Parallels between Aegon the Conqueror and his sister wives. 
feel similar to the Targaryen descendants in the current story, just inverted. Danny the Conqueror and John and Young Griff. I know the thought is that Young Griff is a Blackfire, but that doesn't negate his Targ heritage. I would love the symmetry of Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys, and Danny, John, and Young Griff, or Tyrion, if you lean that way. Thoughts? Yeah, so this has deliberately been set up as uh, not those specific people, but this, the idea that the dragon must have three heads. Um, Aemon thinks about uh, this, uh, you know, Targaryen mustn't be alone. Um, Danny herself thinks you know she's only going to trust two men um the clear implication she's already thinking on this idea of herself as being like egg on the conqueror and then having perhaps these two husbands uh riding the other dragons um so uh her dragon of course drogon is very echoey of uh Balerion the black dread dread uh so uh, her invasion is going to be quite echoing of Aegon's invasion. Will we go down that route of having three Targaryens on three dragons, however you wish to put this together? I certainly think that Jon will um, uh, ride a dragon. I think that I, I love the idea of him riding Rhaegal. I think this being part of showing that he is a Targaryen. Um, but the implication is is from her visions in the House of the Undying that she is going to be showing the lie uh, of um, Fagon. How is that going to happen? The, and what is the lie? The lie is that he's not actually who he claims to be. How could she possibly show that? Uh, maybe she will show that he's not, you know, introduce him to a dragon and he dies um, in the same way that uh, we get someone like Quentin Martell claimed, oh, I've got some Targaryen blood in me, um, tried to tame a dragon and failed. Uh, so uh, I, maybe it's set up as a possibility and then doesn't happen. The the, the third dragon, though, I think there's a, a reasonable chance uh, that uh, Viserion might end up with someone like Euron. Uh, Gilda Green, hey, Robert, Happy New Year. Um, uh, and to you too. Uh, what is a question from a recent live stream that has kept you thinking about it most? I always hear so many interesting things. Oh, it's a good question. Um, you've actually caught me on a wrong one because, as I say, I've, uh, I've, um, uh, I, I shut down completely for two weeks over Christmas. Um, it's, it's really important to me. Just, and I, I don't think about these things at all. Uh, I allow my brain to just relax. Um, and so I'm now struggling to think of specific questions from before Christmas, which have sort of stuck with me. Um, the, of of the, the questions that I've gone through um, today, I mean, I think the one that I'm going to be pondering sort of over the next little while um, are those different angles on what might have happened at the tragedy at Summerhall. Um, uh should we be thinking more about the the idea that maybe it's Rayella being saved that's the most important thing? Uh, should we be thinking about Duncan wanting to save the small folk rather than the um, the high and mighty? Th those are the kinds of things that sort of just uh, the things which stay with me are the ones that challenge my preconceptions about what has been going on. I, I try to, if you're new to the channel. Um, I'm not one of the kind of people who would like say, here's my theory and I'm just going to back it no matter what. If somebody comes with something which challenges that, which has better evidence and, and works better than what I have been saying so far, I will very happily change my mind. When we get new information coming through, when the stage play happens, I, I hope I get to change my mind on a whole load of things. Uh, that's a good thing. That's not me... Um, I will very happily say I've changed my mind. I think what I said there was wrong. I now believe this. Uh, I, I try to put forward what I think is the best answer on the information that we've got. And when new information comes, very happy to change it. So, yeah, the kinds of things which get me thinking are the things which challenge my preconceptions. But interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, 
Jack Delad. Hi, Robert. Do you think that the Night Fort is connected to the Five Forts? It is the oldest castle at the wall. It is described as huge and is built with black stone with a black stone variant. Okay. So, um, for those who don't know what the Five Forts are, if you go right off to the east, the northeast of Yi Ti, which is actually one of the potential um, anime series is, is a golden empire of Yi Ti. Um, uh, so we might get to see this at some point. But um, up there in sort of a gap between a big lake and some big mountains, uh, they have five forts, which are ancient. We know about this from the world of ice and fire. They the ancient five forts built from fused black stone. Uh, we've not had any characters in world who've been there, so everything we've got is slightly secondhand descriptions. But it sounds very similar to, say, the fused black stone that we have at the base of the high tower. Um, and the context hints are that perhaps these were built in response in the same way that the wall seems to have been built in response to the first long night in some way, trying to keep the others out. Uh, the others perhaps also came in the other way around. They didn't just come down into Westeros, they also came down to the northeast of Essos. Um, and so perhaps these five forts are their equivalent of the wall. That's the working theory. We we literally only have a few sentences about them in the world of ice and fire. So it's one of those things that it's easy to over talk about uh, when we have limited inf information. But um, are they connected to the night fort? Well, the night fort is the, as far as we know, the oldest, certainly the biggest of the forts along the wall. Um, so thematically, yes, this is the same. This was built there to defend against another potential uh, attack from the others. Um, and if you're interested uh, in the black stone idea, I did do a video on that if you want a deeper dive into it, because there are at least four different types of black stone. We, we often talk about black stone in the world of the Song of Ice and Fire, but there are distinct variants. There's fused black stone, there's kind of the Valyrian black stone that they use, there's a basalt, there's also an oily black stone, and they appear to be subtly different. Uh, so if you want more, do go and try and find that video. Um, uh, Chaos Ballerina. Um, a theory. Valyrians used fire magic to bring back their slaves to continue working in the mines. This is why death was such a gift to them by the faceless men. Oh, that's an interesting question. So the, the uh, a theory. So um, the, the slaves in the mines of old Valyria are fire whites in some way. Now, um, we have no context clues that this is the case in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but, um, as you say, this idea that death was um, such a mercy for them, uh, yes, absolutely. But the clear implication is that it's such a horrible... There, there were slaves working in mines in a volcano. Uh, in and around a volcano, yes, I think death would have been a mercy to anyone, regardless of whether they were a fire white. But the fact that they were working down in very hot conditions, maybe it would make sense for them to be more of a fire white, because that might make them more um, uh, resistant to the heat. I don't know. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I don't think we've got the context clues to say that that's what's happening yet. Um, Dave Mason, can the Stark children, besides Bran, only wag their wolves, or could Arya literally become Arya Horseface? Well, uh, Arya definitely can walk into more than just her wolf. She walks into cats on at least two occasions. Um, in fact, in, in the books, when she um, 
when she's blind and in order to sort of pass the test show that she can sense what's going on she can see through the eyes of a cat but the faceless men don't know that's what she's doing uh so uh, she is definitely capable of walking into other creatures as well as for the others uh, rob died too soon uh for us to be able to see that uh rickon seems very young who who knows we've lost track of him he's gone feral over on skagos as far as we can tell uh john i mean maybe but we don't know um the interesting one is Sansa, for me anyway, because um, her lady died too soon for her to show much by way of a bond, skin changing bond with um, her direwolf. But George R. R. Martin has stated very clearly that it, that doesn't mean that she doesn't have the ability to do this, it just means that she. She lost the way to um, uh, to sort of manifest it. <coughs> pardon me through um, her direwolf. So, is there a chance that she might walk into something else? Well, yes, and there are some really interesting theories about this. One we've touched on, I think, actually just a bit before Christmas. Um, I can't remember what the context was. Um, might have been the unkiss. I'm not going to go into all of that now. But uh, the you'll remember that when the her die wolf was killed, basically the um, the message from Robert Baratheon was get her a dog. Um, dogs better for her in King's Landing than a wolf. And who does she then become quite attached to? Sandor the Hound. Is there the potential that she has, to some extent, walked into him? Certainly, she seems to affect, have affected him in a way that nobody had done before. He, she seems to bring out a lot more of a sensitive side to him than anyone else had ever seen. Is that was there some kind of bond attaching there? Also, she has this bird theme going on with her um she's often called little bird um and she's uh, when she's in <clears throat> the airy then she sees the eagles flying out above there um there's there's a lot of other bird imagery associated with her and might she walk into a bird at some point it's possible so um yes there's a lot of potential there for all of them can Aya become Aya horseface I, I, there is the potential for that and there is just as an entire random thing um Lyanna Stark we don't know but people have speculated that that there are lots of links between Lyanna and Aya and the way that they're described and Roose Bolton for example says about Liana, she was so good at riding. He said that uh, she's half horse. That one, um, which does make you wonder: was she so good at riding? Was she so connected to the horse that there was some kind of a walking, skin-changing link going on with her and horses? It's possible, uh, but no evidence. But it's it's possible. Uh, Gilda Green saying very respectable answer. I'll, I'll ask again later. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, that was about the the questions i'd had before um derry's read it before is Tyrion a targaryen or the one true lannister offspring i lean targaryen because they're the central family and starks not the lannisters my thoughts oh <clears throat> anyone who's followed this channel for a while and this is this is not a sigh of exasperation at you at all it's it's that the subject matter knows that is Tyrion a targaryen is the the question that I equivocate on the most, it depending on which bit of A Song of Ice and Fire I've most recently been reading, uh, my sort of like Targaryen, not a Targaryen uh, ometer, um, swings wildly from one way to another. Um, uh, it, as you're asking me today, um, I'm 
I'm more on the yeah, he seems quite Targaryen. Um, uh, and that is today's bit of evidence is just simply that I was most recently thinking about the, and this is quite a, a, a different way of looking at it, perhaps. Um, George R. R. Martin, when he started writing, thought he was writing a trilogy. So um, he packed in a lot of information in the first, particularly the first half of book one. Uh, and then you can almost, when you read it, you can almost hear him like screech on the brakes and say, okay, no, we need to slow down giving out this bit of information here. Uh, for example, the Isle of Faces, he has said this is going to be very important, but you see the Isle of Faces gets mentioned uh, three or four times in the first half of book one. And then almost not at all for the rest of the five, the, the the other four books. Um, uh, it's as if he's like, yeah, we have to alert people to the idea that other faces. Oh, okay, actually, I can slow down on that. Tyrion is very similar in terms of the Targaryen Targaryeniness. If you read the first three or four Tyrion chapters, it just hits you over the head with it uh he's fascinated by dragons he used to gaze into the flames for hours at end he used to be re he knows everything he read it every book he could about dragons um he remembers going to see the dragon uh skulls in king's landing um and he thought that they were friendly to him uh he, he sensed this bond with them that is compared to when Arya goes there they uh the the language usage if you compare those two things is astonishingly different the, sh the shadows are almost trying to eat her um so the first few chapters of Tyrion are very Targaryen focused then not at all not at all until we get to towards the end of A Dance with Dragons. Partway through, he's asked to write a book about dragons. While he's on The Shy Maid, he's he's basically says, yeah, I know lots about dragons. I've read every book I can find about dragons. And then he gets asked, well, could you write that all down in a book? He is the dragon law expert. He is the person who is going to arrive to see dragons in uh, Meereen. Um, and almost certainly he's the person who's going to be telling or teaching Daenerys a lot about um, how to, I mean, how to train your dragon, <laughs> if, if we don't mind using that as a sort of terminology. He will understand a lot of the old lore about it that she, nobody will have taught her. But that's today. Uh, on another day, I did relatively recently, I did a, a video about um, uh, the the echoing imagery between Cersei and um, uh, the Mad King, Aerys II, which is very strong in a lot of places. So depends on which day you catch me. Um, uh, feel, feel free to ask in a future live stream what I'm thinking that day. I will probably give a completely different answer. Um, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off. Uh, stop talking about Tyrion for a moment. Um, Stephen uh, over on Patreon says, "Hello, Robert, from a new patron in Australia. Good day to you. Um, I recently found your channel, and I've really enjoyed going through your videos. Have you ever seen the BBC series I Claudius or read the novels it is based on? If so, do you have any thoughts on how it may have influenced either the Song of Ice and Fire novels or the Game of Thrones TV show?" Um, if you haven't seen the series, I definitely recommend it, provided you have a fondness for 70s BBC production values. Um, I heard somewhere that George R. R. Martin has noted it as an influence on Game of Thrones. Um, so, uh, yes. Um, the, 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 answer, the answer is, I've seen, I, I haven't seen the whole series. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I can't remember why I stopped. It's not because I wasn't enjoying it. I, it's exceptional TV. Um, for those who don't know, it's uh, I think Rupert Graves, I think his name is, wrote these stories, uh, books, I, Claudius, basically telling the history of uh, part of the um, Roman Empire. And 
the narrator, they turned this into a BBC TV series in the 1970s, and the narrator is Emperor Claudius, old, as an old man, thinking back through history. And um, it stars Derek Jacobi, um, uh, who's exceptional. Um, the, the reference to BBC 70s production values is basically, the, the BBC didn't have much money in the 1970s, let's put it that way. Um, and this is generally held up as being one of the finest examples of when you don't have the budget, but you do have impeccable writing, fantastic acting, great plot line. You can create gripping TV, even if in the background you can see what's supposed to be a solid wall rippling because it's actually a curtain. Um, you can see what's supposed to be like a marble pillar just sort of wobbling around a bit. You don't pay attention to that because the acting is so good uh, and the story is so good, the dialogue is so good. Um, and the cast, incidentally, if you if you, you cast your eyes down, who's in that cast? It's it's yes, Derek Jacobi is there, who's astonishing. It's got John Hurt. It's got a young Patrick Stewart. It's got Brian Blessed. Um, it's got Bernard Hill, who later is King Third in Lord of the Rings. The list goes on and on and on. It's an absolutely stellar cast of people, often before they were famous. Um, uh, so yeah, anyway. Having waxed lyrical on that, uh, you were asking about George R. Martin's view on this, and he waxes even more lyrical about it. Um, I can't remember exactly where I saw him last talk about this. Um, the, the inspiration for uh, A Song of Ice and Fire... Um, there are plenty of sort of Roman influences, but what I'd love to talk about is something that he's explicitly said when we it was in the build up or around the time of House of the Dragon, pardon me, House of the Dragon season one. And he was explaining he because House of the Dragon, for those who don't know, George R. R. Martin has had an active involvement in House of the Dragon. Not, not he's not the showrunner, he's not writing any episodes, but everything is being run past him. Um, uh, and he was talking about how they were how they decided how to how to adapt the the writing in fire and blood because fire and blood if you've not read fire and blood it's not written as a novel it's written as an in-world history book so a maester has written a history of that part of history uh and in that so you get the maester sort of talking about what happened said well at this point we don't really know exactly what happened maybe yeah you know, according to this source this happened according to that source that happened um and so that leaves us as a reader to kind of make up our own minds about exactly what happened and george R. R. martin was saying when they were thinking about how do we adapt fire and blood they were um trying to figure out could they use the the literary device as a, a device in terms of a TV show. And uh, George R. Martin said they, they did give this active consideration, and he uses I, Claudius, as an example. Because in I, Claudius, Claudius himself, Derek Jacobi, is basically, he's, he sort of starts and ends the episodes. He sort of does the intro bit. He explains a bit about what's going on. He narrates some stuff. But we're seeing stuff that's happening through history. And he's George R. Martin was saying, we thought about doing that here. We thought about making that. This is how we do it. And in that way, you could then keep up this. Uh, this happened over here. Oh, but maybe actually that happened. And you could show both of the you could show both what Septon Eustace and Mushroom said. And lead it, leave it to the viewer to decide in the same way that George R. R. Martin leaves it to the reader to decide in, in uh, Fire and Blood. But they eventually decided against it. Um, but that didn't stop George R. R. Martin saying how much he loved I, Claudius. He thought, thought it was fantastic. And if you do get a chance um, uh, to watch it, then please uh, do. Um, Hammer Time 51 saying, got to leave work early and participate in, in the live stream. Oh, excellent. Uh, my lucky day. Thanks for the content, Robert, and happy new year. Happy new year to you too. Um, 
Uh, Derry's read it before saying, I adore Brian Blessed. He's my headcanon for Terry Pratchett's uh, Rid Kali. Um, yeah, he's, Brian Blessed is astonishing. Um, uh, oh, Cold Cast Knock in the chat has done a, a, a link across to YouTube. Watch I Claudius here. Yeah, do go and have a look at the, that. Um, um, username redacted. Do we have evidence of Westerosi's lords and small folk? Well, pardon me. Do we have evidence of Westerosi's lords and small folk adopt Targaryens, Valarions, Celticars, etc.? Um, interesting. I can't off the top of my head. I'm happy if the chat. I'll have a look in the chat in a moment. If the chat can think of any examples, that that I think that would be. Um, fascinating certainly in terms of the kind of the rituals and things like that no i there's no as far as i can tell we've not seen anyone will now burn our dead because that's what the targaryens did or um uh, will worship the targaryen gods the the targaryens did not encourage it it has to be said, and then perhaps this is the central point here, is that whereas you get the Andal invasion, it was a very long, slow invasion. It, it was more like a Andal migration uh, with occasional battles uh, over centuries. Uh, that was uh, hit them bringing in their culture with a view to <clears throat> their new land will have their culture. Uh, so that was what was going on there. The Valyrians were clear from the start they they kept their culture you keep your culture they did not try and change the culture of anyone else in fact when you get um jaharis the first with his doctrine of exceptionalism which basically says um targaryens don't have to follow the rules of the faith of the seven because we're valyrians we're different um the the flip side of that is that you don't or probably even shouldn't be trying to follow our rules because you're not us. So the Targaryens were deliberately keeping themselves different and apart and not trying to get anyone else to change to be like them. Um Is that me caught up, roughly caught up in the chat. Um, Andrew Case saying, if only Brian Blessed was half his age, he could have been an incredible Bobby B, Robert Baratheon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Mark Addy did a fantastic job there, it has to be said. Uh, but yes, he um, uh, he definitely could. So the big booming voice, the, the, the physique would have been fantastic. Um, let's go to... Uh, do, 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 do. Let's get to another question from my patrons. Howland's little sister saying, I hope 2024 gives us all the gift we are waiting for, the completion of the Winds of Winter. Um, yeah, I hope that too. I don't, I've given up guessing when it's going to be. I, I think, I think it's a bit ambitious to expect it this year, I'll be honest. But um, as, as I'm sort of drip feeding the interesting things to look forward to this year, we do get a book which is going to happen this year. Uh, we, we're getting out a new Witcher book, um, which is fantastic. Uh, Andrei Sapkowski has announced, he announced towards the end of last year, that he is writing a new Witcher book, uh, a full novel, um, which is going to be set roughly during the period of the short stories for those who are engaged in the Witcher world. Uh, so before the five novel series. Um, uh, and... Um, it's going to be published first in Polish towards the end of this year uh, and then a bit later once it's been translated in uh, English and other languages. But that's that's fantastic. Uh, get, getting a new bit of uh, literature is, um, uh, yeah, it's really something exciting to look forward to. Anyway, um, I have a theory, says Howland's little sister. I have a theory about my namesake, Howland Reed. It goes like this. 
Howland was allowed to live on the Isle of Faces in the God's Eye Lake because the children of the forest, a blood raven, knew the importance of keeping Howland and his descendants alive because he and his children would play an integral part in the story of Jon Snow, Daenerys, and the final battle to come with the others. The children of the forest and blood raven gave special knowledge to Howland of the past and what was to come. Imagine the scene of Howland, the leader of the children at the centre of the aisle, surrounded by weirwood trees, being given the story of the past and coming future. What a scene that would be. Um, uh, I would love to have this as a rare flashback storyline where George R. Martin tells us about why, where, and when these internet interconnecting narratives occurred. Yes, so this is a fascinating idea. Uh, and it's we know it's at least partly right, I think. Uh, he was allowed rare. Only two people we know of have been allowed onto the Isle of Faces in recent-ish memory. Adam Valarion, who just basically dropped down there on a dragon, and Howland Reed. Now, uh, was he shown past, present, and future by the Weirwood Network? My instinct is he might have been shown past, uh, I think he was told what was to happen, what his role was in the next bit of the near future. Um, about the turning at Harren Hall, what he needed to do over the course of the next few months. Um, I don't think he was told the longer term. The reason why I say I don't think he was told the longer term is that his... Um, when... Jojen and Mira head up to Winterfell to get Bran and to take him north. It was really quite vague. Uh, Hound's the person who sort of says, "Yeah, I think you should go up to Winterfell," but he he doesn't give direct. He doesn't say, "Ah, oh, this will be Bran. I've seen this." <coughs> it's still a little bit vague. Um, and when Jojen and Mira get up there, they're still trying to figure out who this vision that that. that um, uh, Jojen had had was about they finally decided it must be Bran um, but if Howland had known I suspect he would have said so are we going to get a flashback to that I mean we at some point George R. Martin has promised us at some point we are going to get uh, Howland Reed and he is going to tell us a huge amount of history um, I don't think he'll tell us the details about what happened on the Isle of Faces but a guy can dream. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Um, okay, let's go to um, Emma Scheiman saying hello and Happy New Year. And to you too. My question is inspired by what I see as a slight but significant change to Eamon's character uh, from book to show. In House of the Dragon, Eamon is shown to have far less control and maturity than he seemed to in the book. How might this character change affect his relationship with Alice Rivers? I never gave much credence to the Maester's theories that Alice had bewitched Aemond. They tend to make such claims about any woman in proximity to power. But I'm now wondering if Aemond will continue to be portrayed as a boy out of control, with Vega and now Alice calling the shots behind the scenes. Will Alice have a bigger role in this story as Messeria has? I, will she have a bigger role? I, I think very likely. Um... What is is there a, a big shift in his character? Um, I don't think it's a massive shift between the book and the show. I can I can see what you're what you're saying. Um, the the big difference is the lack of control over Vagar, which we're not told about in the book, but this does. It works in as much as as long as he comes back and says, oh, yeah, I did it, uh, rather than say, I lost control of my dragon, and that's what happened, then the, the two do still work together. We're just seeing a slightly different angle to uh, what happened. Aymond, um certainly seems to have a, the feeling that he would be a better king than Aegon. That has come out very strongly in the show, and that is definitely hinted at, more than hinted at, I think, in Fire and Blood. So I think that's definitely there. Will Alice Rivers take control of him in some way? Um, I, I think we'll have to wait and see how they play that, uh, but I think that they won't be able to 
resist having her i think i think they will have her doing magic um and i can certainly imagine that she might wish to try and um <clears throat> ingratiate herself with uh with Amond and use magic in order to do that uh, they did uh, i didn't spot this aziz uh, pointed this out to me they did if you remember a scene where Amond goes he's down he's looking for aegon and he goes uh, with Kristen Cole and he goes into um, uh, Flea Bottom and he goes to a brothel uh, to uh, a woman whose services he has clearly used and she is clearly a much older woman than him um, and uh, Kristen Cole kind of notes this um, that uh, as has been pointed out that perhaps suggests that he has got a thing for an older woman who Alice Rivers is. So they are perhaps teeing this up that maybe she would naturally, not just through magic, but naturally she's the kind of woman that he might go for. Um, okay, uh, Jenny Bird saying, welcome back, Robert. Thank you. Um, I would like to know your thoughts on the curious case of the dragon seed Adam Valarion. Officially, he was the illegitimate son of Lenor Valarion. However, many believe him to actually be Corliss's natural son, which I believe more likely to be the case as well. However, if he was the son of Corliss, how could he claim a dragon? Didn't Lenor's dragon riding ability come from his mother, Rhaenys, rather than Corliss? Was Adam's mother, Marilda, perhaps a dragon seed? Much ado has been made over nettles and whether she had Targaryen blood, um, but I can't recall any debate around Adam. Okay. So uh, I think there's a couple of layers here. I, I would tend to agree with you that, yes, um, Adam and Alan are almost certainly going to be the Sea Snakes' bastard children rather than Lainor's. Lainor is gay. Um, uh, there's nothing in the books or the TV show to suggest um, that he would have been fathering children on random or even not random women in a hull. Um, Corlys Velaryon, if he is their, their father, on all the hints are that the way that he acts, um, certainly after Rhaenys dies, is basically to acknowledge them and say, yes, he doesn't say they're mine, but he acts like very much their... Um, uh, he acts like they're his, but let's put it that way. Um, so that's the first bit. The second bit is how, therefore, could they be, you know, dragon riders? Well, this all depends on this idea of where, where can, where do you get this dragon riding ability from? Now, the Targaryens clearly their their idea is. The Targaryen, you have to be a Targaryen in order to ride dragons. This is proof that you're a Targaryen. Um, and um, uh, the dragon seeds is just this idea of your maybe if you're half Targaryen, you might be able to. Um, but we have to acknowledge a few things here. First of all, you don't have to be 100% Targaryen in order to be able to ride a dragon. Daenerys, who we think many years later, Daenerys, we think of as being, yeah, here's this kind of pure Targaryen in some way. Of course, she should be able to ride a dragon. She is, if you look at her family tree, at most one-eighth Targaryen. If you go back through, you know, who her parents were, who their parents were. Um, uh, she, there's Blackwood blood going on in there. There's Arryn blood going on. And there's a lot of different um, ancestries that are all mixing up um, to make her, as I say, at most one eighth Targaryen. So it's not, it's not, this is a myth, this idea that you have to be pure Targaryen. So the second thing is the Velaryons themselves have been intermarrying with the Targaryens for quite some time. Now, we don't know all of the details. We, we know uh, what's happened after the invasion, 
Uh, but they, before that, almost certainly were intermarrying with the Targaryens even more. For example, the mother of Aegon the Conqueror, Visenya and Rhaenys, their mother was a Velaryon. So the just because Corlys Velaryon has the surname Velaryon rather than Targaryen does not mean that there's no Targaryen ancestry in there at all. Um, and then sort of third, yeah, absolutely, we don't know anything about her mother other than the fact that she appears to have been um, quite impressive. We're not given huge amounts of information. The maesters, uh, as, as per the previous question, the maesters are often quite disparaging um, and dismissive of women um, in Fire and Blood and in uh, the World of Ice and Fire. Uh, so we don't get to hear huge amounts about their mother, but the little bits that we do hear is that, so she started out as just being, you know, someone down in Hull, but then she built up a business um, and then it turned into quite an impressive business and she basically uh, sort of owned a huge amount of land uh, and that she seems to be relatively self-made. So she seems quite an impressive person. Um, so might she herself be a dragon seed? That's possible. So on a number of levels, I don't think we need to worry about it too much. Um, the, the nettles thing is uh, partly her, her colouring looks nothing like the traditional Valyrian colouring in the books, at least. Um, uh, no idea whether she's even in season two yet. We've... Uh, that's another is issue entirely. She will appear. Do not worry. She will appear in House of the Dragon. They may keep her back until season three. I do not know. Um, but the issue there is the fact that the, nobody knows who's what, what parentage she might have. She doesn't claim anything. So um, that's a, a bit of a mystery. Um, Let's have a quick flick through. Um, okay, let's go to some more questions from my patrons. Um, these are most of my patrons' questions. I've mostly done a song of ice and fire. We'll, we'll make it a another longish live stream. I think just just be, um, uh, because it's the first one back. Um, so let's go to well, these. Have mostly been a song of ice and fire. We'll do Lord of the Rings ones um, in a bit. Whitney's saying, um, "I would like to know what is your favourite thing about a song of ice and fire." Also, what is your biggest criticism, aside from it not being finished? Uh, personally, my favourite thing is how creepy it can be. Um, I found this a really interesting question. Um, what is my favourite thing? Um, I think it's the rereadability, and And this is something that I've... I mean, it, it sounds quite a dull thing to say, oh, because I can read it again and again. Lots of books you could read again and again. Um, one thing which, if you ever stumble across it, both Tolkien and C.S. Lewis talked about several times is this idea of rereadability in terms of the quality of a book. And, and what they both said is that the first time you read a book, any book, you can be caught up in it because of the plot twists, because of the surprises. Um, you didn't know what was going to happen. Um, the real test of a book is not that. It's whether if you read it again, you're enjoying it the second time through, when you know what's going to happen. Is there something in the the writing? Is there something in the world? Is there something in the plot which engages you perhaps even more the second time you go through it um, and the third time and the fourth time? And that is the mark of something truly great. Uh, and for me, that is what works with The Song of Ice and Fire is that you um, there are so many layers to the story that you pick up new things each time. Um, it's not just the quality of the language. I think George R. R. Martin is an excellent writer, um, uh, but also the way for me that he layers plot and revelation. And I'll give you the one example of this, which I've, I think I've done a couple of times before in these live streams. Um, Aya's last chapter in uh, Clash of Kings is great. 
because you read it through. This is from Arya's perspective. The first time you read it through, it's, it's a good and fun and interesting chapter. Um, everyone's up in arms about what's going on. They hear news of, like, the... Um, uh, basically, Rob has married the wrong person. Um, uh, that everybody that she sits in on a, a meeting, a war meeting with Roos Bolton and his advisors. What are they going to do there? Um, uh, she there's there's a, a Jack and assassinations. There's decision for to leave. There's a lot going on. So it's a great first chapter, first read through. Second time you read through, you start noticing a few extra details. Um, that perhaps you hadn't noticed the first time around. The kinds of things that Arya did not notice, it's from her POV, she did not pick up on because she wouldn't as a character, but you as a reader do. So, for example, she randomly meets a Frey child who is bemoaning the fact that he was supposed to marry a princess and now he's not going to. And she has absolutely no sympathy for this, um, as you'd expect. Um, but when you stop and think about it, you go, well, who, which Frey could possibly be thinking that they're going to marry a princess? And then you realise that although we're all talking about, you know, the deal that was struck that John had to be, not John, Rob had to be marrying a Frey, another part of that deal, which hardly ever gets mentioned, is that Arya was promised to marry a Frey as well. Um, and she didn't really engage with this as an idea and she certainly never engaged with the fact that her brother's now a king which means that that makes her a princess so she does not realize that actually she's having a conversation with the person that she is technically betrothed to um that's the layer that you you don't pick up on the first read through but even better there are things that you do not pick up until you've read the next book and then you come back and you see that this is foreshadowing for things which have not yet even happened. Um, the the build-up to the Red Wedding, so much of it, what Rob of um, Roose Bolton's planning and thought process, uh, he dispatches some soldiers off to take Duskendale. I has got no idea about that. It's only much later you realise quite what's going on there i've covered that in various other videos but he's basically eliminating some of rob's loyal soldiers uh, and sending a signal over to um uh, time and lannister so th but each time you come back to that chapter you enjoy the language but also you get more layers to what's going on um as for what i uh biggest criticism i don't think criticism is the right word uh the the thing i um, miss most in a song of ice and fire that i find in other things like lord of the rings is hope um i i i, I need a bit of hope in my life this is something tolkien always had there's always hope in tolkien's world uh, even in the darkest of times uh george R. R. martin writes grim dark uh, that's it's, it's fantasy fiction which um if if everything ended terribly if your favorite character dies that's to be expected you've you've not got the hope there um let's go to michelle Raimo saying hi robert hope you had a wonderful holiday season um uh, and i hope dan is well too dan is well uh thank you he's uh he can't make up his mind today I, he's behind the green screen uh, he goes upstairs stays up there for half an hour then comes back downstairs shakes a bit and then goes back upstairs again he's uh he's not sure what he wants to do today but he is well um i read george martin's uh new year's eve not a blog post um and he mentioned something interesting my beloved corliss valarion's show nine voyages has been moved from live action to animation and George seemed confident that change will get it greenlit quicker as it's already in development. Um, I'm excited because I feel with animation they will really be able to dive into the magic of Planetos and can finally see more of the world. Uh, what are your thoughts on this move and what city or part of the world are you most excited to see? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, a lot here to unpack. Another thing uh, to look forward to. Um, the there's two 
as we know, two spin-offs from Game of Thrones greenlit. One is obviously House of the Dragon. One is uh, Duncan Egg, which they're going to start filming this year. But there are various other things which are in development or pre-development. Um, and George o. Martin mentions them from time to time. Um, there's an anime, Yeetie-based anime that they're talking about. There's um, 10,000 Ships, the Nymeria Martell story, uh, which would be live action. They've been talking about that for a while. There's the Jon Snow show um, that it's all gone a bit quiet on recently. I think I saw um, Kit Harrington or a report of Kit Harrington. I've not actually seen him say it at, at a con or something like that. Um, sort of talking it down a little bit as in it's not happening straight away. Don't expect it to happen, but we're still working. Um uh, the the latest news in Georgia Martin's not a blog um, was he was talking about um, Blue Eyes Samurai. He was saying things that he'd re recently been watching. Blue Eyes Samurai. I don't know Blue Eyes Samurai. I've not seen it, but he loved it. He watched it. He said this was amazing artwork and showed how great anime could be talking of anime he, he's almost it's like a, hey anime can be wonderful uh and as we're talking about that um so you know we've been trying to develop and this has been going three or four years now this um concept of nine voyages the nine voyages of call is when he was a younger man uh it's um this idea of doing a tv show with a kind of a Sinbad feel to it, I guess. We're out on the high seas, we're exploring new parts of the world, uh, a new city, a new port, um, adventures, hijinks, uh, magic, uh, treasures. Um, th th it sounded wonderful. Um, and it sounded wonderful not just because it sounded like a cool idea for a TV show, but also, more than anything else, gave us the potential to be seeing more of the world. Because the idea is, Corus Valarion, in his nine voyages, nine voyages did go almost everywhere in the known world. Karth, the Shy, Sunset Islands, Basilisk Islands, uh, Ib, you know, he went all over the place. And so this would potentially give us the chance to see so much of this world. Um, uh, and um, you're asking actually in the question, where would I most want to see a shy? I'd love to see a shy. Now, this was being developed by Bruno Heller, who was the guy behind Rome. Um, and George R. Martin loved Rome, the TV show. Um, and I was starting to get a bit concerned about it, I have to say, because it had been uh there and going for so long as an idea with a very clear person in charge very clearly going through several iterations of idea or script and still not getting the green light added to which undoubtedly this would be big budget and uh hbo and many other places are looking to where can we Trim our costs a bit. Um, House of the Dragon is big budget, but uh, do they? Uh, how confident are they that this Nine Voyages would would justify a big budget as well? They're going to a new place every time. They need to build new sets. They need to uh, have out being out on the high seas that have, you know. Uh, building a boat, perhaps. These things do cost a lot of money. So I was a bit concerned about it. But George R. Martin has now said that has shifted, so it's not going to be live action. It is going to be anime. Still not greenlit, but I think this is a very positive step. I agree if if the anime can be done well, this is a way to see Planetos, and, and it will be fantastic. Um, the other thing which sort of went under the radar on what George R. Martin was saying is that he he keeps emphasizing not all of these projects that we're talking about will happen. Some of them almost certainly won't. Maybe many, maybe most won't happen. So um, 
when they if they don't happen, he prefers the word shelved rather than canned or decided that we're not going to do it um, because he thinks that they could come back if not um, as a TV show, perhaps in some other form. And he talked about graphic novels in particular. So I think this was, it may have seemed like not much of an update from him, but I think that the hints are here. I think that this is the next one on the radar that we should be looking out for um, is this anime. I think anime obviously is cheaper, less risk for HBO. Uh, so I think that they would, um, and as they've deliberately shifted this across, and he is, he would have had to clear this with them um, before talking about it in this length. Um, I think the hints are that this might be the next thing to get greenlit, which I think would be fantastic news. And I think that the fact that uh, if something gets shelved, he's already thinking of how do we get this story out there um, is also very positive because that might mean for example if they decide they do not wish to do the nymeria story they've got it plotted that's been going in the works for three years or more now as well uh, that might be turned into a graphic novel which would if you if we don't get the tv show then we still get to see it in some ways which i so i think this is overall incredibly um uh incredibly positive uh, for the seeing more of the world um let's go to the chat um a bit of love for down the dog going on in in the chat uh exactly as it should be um and andrew case saying uh i that dan has made up his mind he wants a cameo it is known uh, i'll get you some dan pictures uh in in fact at some point soon i'm going to be shifting my setup here and maybe he could get in as it stands he cannot get past this screen anyway so um uh, dan cameos are not possible right now um effect rambling we want a dan dose on insta if if it can't give he can't be okay i i get the dan love we will deal with that um uh, let's go to um question from martin s uh, this is Lord of the Rings question. Do you think Frodo saw Taniquetl? If so, how would he react? Um, yeah, so I think he definitely got over, he did reach um, the Undying Lands. He's having a shake now, Dan, in fact. Um, and taking himself back upstairs again. Uh, so Frodo did indeed uh, get to uh, the. Tanner Crystal, I think um, we don't know. Actually, we don't know is the is the first answer. We're not told what happens. Frodo heads west, and and that's it. Um, but uh, yeah, I I think it's not so much of him how he reacts to seeing things. I think it's the rest. That's what the key thing is for Frodo. He heads west because he needs. The world is a wearisome burden for him now. Um, he has suffered so much, and he just needs the rest. So that is the the key thing. A lot of love for Blue Eyed Samurai in the chat, actually. Um, uh, so George R. Martin generally has very good taste. It has to be said, um, and uh, the chat is giving it ten out of ten. Um, Luna Cascade saying, I like anime, but I want live, not anime, for the Song of Ice and Fire universe. Yeah, I would prefer live as well. I think the 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 thing is, if we can't get live, do you want anime on nothing? And I think the answer is, I want anime. And when anime is done well, it can work incredibly, uh, incredibly well. Um, uh, reflective rambling saying, I still mourn the flea bottom one being scrapped. Wanted a sort of mystery, sneaky sneak of ignored people's thing. Yeah, so this was, we, we've now, we're starting to get. Um, sort of a list of things that they decided not to do flea but i don't know if they ever had a proper name for it but this was something which george R. R. martin confirmed they had been trying to develop but decided not to this was a couple of years ago the idea being all of these stories are written about the one percent they're written about the people at the top of society they're written about the rich they're written about the uh the the 
top members of the top houses in Westeros, why don't we write a story and show the small folk? Which I liked that idea. I thought it, it was a good idea. I think it was in keeping with George R. R. Martin's world. Um, but it, they didn't go ahead. So yeah, I, I mourn that too. I, I, I would have liked it, but not to be. I, I mean, I think even um, if, if you'd given me the choice between that and Duncan Egg, I'd go for Duncan Egg every time, though. So, yes, I'm on it, but I accept that. Um, uh, question Raven's Oath saying, Will they hide the Blood Moon pilot from us forever? Probably. <laughs> um, so for those who missed this, if you if you weren't around in the fandom at the time, um, this was a big thing. Um, after at some point around season seven of Game of Thrones, HBO, obviously they realized they had the biggest TV show in the world on their hands. And they... Um, we're trying to work out how what where do we go with this hbo had never until house of the dragon they had never done a spin-off they'd never done a sequel they'd only ever done a, a tv show and then moved on to do something else completely different um so this is the first time they did that um uh, and they decided to do um uh blood omen which was going to be set back in uh, the first long night, basically, um, they did a pilot for this. Um, uh, this was going. This was the showrunner was uh, Jane Goldman, uh, who was very talented. Um, they got some very good names on board. I can't. I think John Sim, who's an excellent actor, was on board. They had another couple of people I can't remember. They filmed the pilot. <coughs> pardon me, a pilot for it. They spent. 35 million dollars in development for this pilot and then they pulled the rug and we have never been told the detail of this um the very same day they announced going straight to full season house of the dragon um, not going down the pilot road, just going to order a whole season. Um, this was a shift in direction where they had seen, and again, at some point we will get all of the background story, I'm sure, from HBO. Um, they saw what happened with Game of Thrones Season 8. They saw this was... George R. Martin was not involved in Game of Thrones Season 8. He was involved in the early seasons, Seasons 1 to 4. He was not involved in the later seasons. Um whatever that pilot for um, Blood Omen was like, he was not really involved in that. And this was about things that he has not written about in depth. And an executive decision was made somewhere in HBO that for the spin-offs that they have from um george r. r martin and they paid george r. r martin a lot of money for the right to be doing spin-offs i think it was 50 million dollars they paid him uh, so this is a lot of money plus the 35 million dollars they spent on blood omen this is a lot of money they'd already sunk into this idea um they they decided they were going to do spin-offs based on things that he had already written and he was going to be more involved so that's at least part of the reason why blood omen was stopped um, and they went with a story that had already been written in Fire and Blood and why they've gone with Duncan Egg next because the first three Duncan Egg stories are written why when they're thinking about what they might do after House of the Dragon they're thinking about things like Aegon's Conquest rather than something like the Blackfire Rebellions uh, because this is something we've got George R. Martin having written huge amounts about already so this is the strategic direction. If they went with something, this is almost certainly why they're holding back on something like um, Nine Voyages. If you go and look in Fire and Blood, the description of Nine Vo the Nine Voyages, it's about a page. This is completely, this is new territory. This is somebody who will have to make up a lot. 
House of the Dragon is largely sticking to what we've got in Fire and Blood. If they do an Aegon's Invasion one, they can largely stick to what George R. Martin has written. This would be new. All of it would be completely new. Completely new stories, completely new information about the places that he's going to. What's How much have we got written about the Basilisk Isles? Not a lot. So this is potentially a big shift in a different direction and a, a riskier for um, not just them, but also George R. R. Martin, because suddenly his world is going to be opened up um, and there's going to be a different owner because there's going to be a showrunner in charge of that. And it's not him writing about it. He will have involvement, but it's not him writing about it. So th it's, this is, I think, one of the reasons why they have been hesitant on that in particular, because there's not much to go on to write the stories. Um, anyway. Uh, Raven, that that was sorry. That was a complete digression from Raven's Oath, Oath asking, "Will they hide the Blood Moon Pilot from us forever?" I think the answer is uh, probably, or at least for a very long time still. Um, Andrew K saying, "I'll take a canonical graphic novel Long Night project over whatever Blood Moon was." Yeah, I think I'm with you. I still want to see it. Um, uh, but yeah, I think I agree. Uh, Martin S., do you think Rhaenyra knows how Damon's first wife died and Damon's part in it, such as it was? Yeah, I think I think so. Um, uh, so yeah, his in the books, he is a lot more of a suspicious character. I mean, his um, the the TV show. They left it slightly vague, but basically he was there when she died. Um, and in the books, it's just very clear, yeah, he, he killed her. And the clear hints are that he killed her and he had a role in the death of um, Lenor. And potentially he also had a role in the death of Harwin, her lover. So... Those three things happened in very quick succession, allowing the two of them to marry. So he comes across as a lot more of a dark character in the books than he does on the show. Uh, Karis Ballerina, um, Euron, no, to make an heir that's worthy of him, I need a different woman. When the Kraken weds the dragon, let all the world beware. Who is him? Is Euron working with or for somebody or an entity? Um, uh, do, 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 to make an heir that's worthy of him when the Kraken... Okay, so him, I think, is himself. <laughs> um, sorry, and that, that... So this is uh, this is a quote from uh, Euron. He's basically saying um, he... So he wants to marry Daenerys um, because he thinks that if the uh, the um, uh, if he is to have children, um, they should come from a great mother. And so, yeah, uh, to make an heir that's worthy of him, an heir worthy of him, he needs a different woman. That's that's my take. I would have to look at that in context though, just to see whether or not he's doing he's saying something else. But that's my initial take on that. Um. Uh, Borton Short. Happy New Year, Robert, and to you. The first time I'm asking questions. You're very welcome. Uh, you asked three... Uh, th th they came across as quite quick-fire questions, so I'll answer them in a sort of a quick-fire way. When Illyrio and Varys are heard talking in the deeps of the Red Keep by Arya, uh, why would they be speaking in the common tongue instead of any dialect from Pentos, Lys, etc.? Uh, interesting question, and it's one that people have often... Uh, come up with as a, uh, a sort of is this a plot hole? Arya is hiding in the dragon skull and she hears Illyrio and Varys talking as they're walking past. They we're not told that they're talking in a foreign language, the implication is that they're talking Westerosi common, which is why Arya can understand them. Um, is, is this a plot hole? I mean. It's it's possible this was written, this is 
quite early before the world had been hugely expanded. So it's entirely possible that this is just a remnant from a, I've not really worked through all of the histories of the, the lands over in Essos. Um, and we do know that Illyrio clearly speaks good, um, common, good Westerosi. Um, so, and Varys obviously does as well. Uh, is this a plot hole? Well, perhaps it's a remnant of those that where it was at the time, uh, but perhaps also uh, we can explain it in world. So the Valyria, the way that the language structure works in Essos um, is that you have High Valyrian, which we often talk about. That's where we get all these words like Dracaris, Velomogulis, and things like that. That is effectively Latin. Uh, it's a dead, an obsolete language um, that the the well-to-do people know and understand, uh, but nobody really uses anymore. They don't. You don't speak in High Valyrian uh, anymore. What each of the free cities has is a dialect of Low Valyrian. So they have, um, they, it's in the same way that Latin uh, has, and I'm not a philologist, so apologies to any philologists for, I'm sure, oversimplifying this, but from Latin has flowed a number of different Latinate languages, um, uh, which uh, sound relatively similar, but, um, uh, there's different words, different, uh, and, and it's hard to understand from one to another. That's what we've got in the free cities. Different local dialects that are almost different languages. So what would Varys and Illyrio speak in? Well, maybe they both could speak the similar local dialect, but by this point, Varys is speaking... Um, Westerosi common all the time. Illyrio clearly speaks it, so it is a shared language. So maybe that is the language they do speak to each other in, even if it isn't their own first language. Um, second question, how come Ned did not recognise Yorin when they met in King's Landing? I thought Yorin was a seasoned recruiter of the Watch and thus would have spent many a night at Winterfell. Uh, yeah, this is, again, this is a book one thing. Um, when Yorin rushes down to King's Landing, he co goes up to see Ned uh, and as Hand of the King, he's going give, to give him information that Cat has just uh, captured Tyrion. Uh, and Ned basically says, members of the Night's Watch are always welcome, my friend, but what's your name? Uh, and Yoren tells him his name. Uh, is, is this a little bit weird? Would Ned have known? Maybe he would have done. But Yoren, uh, maybe he should have done indeed. Um, but Yoren, uh, is he's a recruiter and he does go around the Seven Kingdoms. But... Does he recruit people from Winterfell? No, that doesn't seem to be how the relationship with Winterfell goes. What Yoren's role seems to be is to go to the places that don't think that the wall is the right place to be sending people and then just say, give us your uh, low lives, give us the people in your prisons, um, anyone you want to send out on exile, give them to me. That seems to be what his job is. He doesn't need to go to... Winterfell for that. Winterfell sees going to the wall almost as an honour. Um, and they already have somebody who has very good connections in Winterfell and has does go there on a relatively regular basis. Um, Benjen. Benjen, it's not that he doesn't go there all the time, but he definitely has gone back several times to Winterfell during that period. So um, it makes sense that they don't need to send Euron to Winterfell. So it makes sense that Ned might not know his name or remember his name. Uh, and three, if Hostetali's wife is Minissa Went, shouldn't Edmure be heir to Harrenhal? Um, so yes, the, the Went at the start of the story that House Went are still in control of Harrenhal, um, Shella went, old lady went, is there, um, and she's basically called the last of the house went. So we don't know the details of this, but um, 
uh, Minissa went. We don't know what relation she is. She married into the Tullys. Um, who is the heir, according to the House Went, who is the heir of Harrenhal? We're not told this. Uh, maybe they might assume this would revert back up to House Tully. Maybe that's what they're thinking. We're not told. In any event, it doesn't really make a difference because um, in the story, the Iron Throne just keeps on distributing um, Harren Hall um, to, uh, uh, first of all, to the head of the, the I always have one uh, mind blank moment every live stream uh the um uh, the head of the gold cloaks you know who he is I'm sure the chat will pick him up and then little finger gets it uh after that so um it's 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 really who who technically was the wentz uh heir is not really an issue in uh in the story Tristan Chan. Hey, Robert. Happy New Year. What was your honest opinion about the Rings of Power show? How did you feel about Sauron being Hellbrand <laughs> up the gun as well? Um, yeah, you, until about a month ago, you were having a very good season. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, if, I hope, frankly, I'd rather you win it than City or Liverpool, but digression. Um, what did I think about uh, Rings of Power? I mean, my my take has not really changed um i will i will say uh about rings of power it's uh i'm not genuinely not holding anything back in terms of what i think about rings of power um i enjoyed it uh i like fantasy tv shows i thought it looked really good i thought some of the um some of the characters at Adar I thought was excellent I loved Casa Doom how that looked um I thought D Durin the Elder King Durin was a really good show of what dwarf should be like I thought there were many good points about it I thought the music was really good as well um I don't think it was a very good adaptation of Tolkien um uh, I think that there were some elements that uh could have been better let's put it that way uh in terms of the the writing um but overall i enjoyed it um i i i'm not one of those people who feels that something has to be a perfect adaptation in order for it to be good um uh i'm so th the fact that I can I can happily recognize where something is not a good adaptation of a source material and recognize that it may that doesn't mean that it can't be good. I thought that a lot of what Peter Jackson did um, changed what was in the original. And frankly, if it had happened in the in age of the Internet, then there, it would be getting a whole lot more hate from uh, certain quarters, I suspect, than it did at the time. Um uh, but that doesn't stop me also saying I think that's probably about as good as cinema gets. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's my general take on uh, The Rings of Power. Um, how did I feel about Sauron being Halbrand? I don't personally see... Um, I mean... Uh, it's, it's fine. It's not Tolkien. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I didn't understand why they needed to do to do it in a way that Tolkien did it. They've, they've got the greatest fantasy world ever created uh, in terms of depth and, and wonder, and um, I didn't quite get why they needed to do it, produce it in a mystery box kind of way that meant that um, we would, people who knew and loved the story were potentially kept guessing about what was going on. But... Um, as I say, the headline is I enjoyed it. And I know a whole load of other people who enjoyed it. Um, and I know a whole load of people who were introduced to the wonderful world of Tolkien through it. And so I think I've got to be grateful for it. And there are many, many wonderful things about it. Um, we are, if you don't mind me digressing slightly in, on, on this, actually, I, just a thing I have said before, but I think is, it bears saying um, that 
we we live in a world sometimes that everyone wants to just say something is either horrendous or brilliant um and i think we just need to have a little bit more of an understanding of that things aren't just one thing rings of power was not either brilliant or horrendous there are some things about the rings of power which were brilliant there were some things about the rings of power which you might think were horrendous there are a lot of things which are in between um, it can be all of those things at the same time some people can really like it and some people can really not like it and that is all okay um so yeah it's very rare to have a flawless something and it's very rare to have something which is all bad anyway mini rant over um uh, um Luna Cascade, do you think they'll ship Alicent and Kristen on the TV show? Um, Alicent and Kristen Cole, no, I don't think so. Um, I, th I think the way that they set that up was very much um, that he's holding her up as his sort of perfect ideal um, uh, who is there and going to allow him to get the vengeance that he wants on Rhaenyra. I think that's the way they're setting that up. Um, let's go to... I think I had another question here in the chat. Um, reflective rambling. Um, picking up for Roma Steve. Book one, Arya hears a Bravosi voice in her head. Not sure it's Sirio. It could be future Arya in her Bravosi accent helping her past self. Uh, I would have to come back on that one, I'm afraid. Um, I will try and take a note on that and have a look um, and see where I can find it. Um, uh, I've certainly never thought that there's a future Ara coming back, Arya coming back to help her past self, but I would uh, be intrigued if there were. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. <clears throat> um, Oh, Amy Smith talking about Percy Jackson. This is a thing, actually, I wanted to very briefly touch on. Uh, the latest Percy Jackson show is a great example of a faithful adaptation, but still making relevant changes. I, I'm, I'm four episodes in. I think they've only released four episodes of the Percy Jackson um, TV show, which is on Disney Plus, I think. Um, I'm enjoying it. I, I am. I, it's it's not amazing. and It's not the kind of thing that I, I, I think I'm going to cover on the channel. Uh, but I recently read book one um, over the summer. Um, and yeah, it comes across as a, a pretty strong adaptation um, that uh, clearly makes some changes to work for the screen. Um, and um, I think it I think it works well for me. So yeah, I'm enjoying it so far. I'm interested to see where they go with it. It, it certainly worked well um, compared to the films from a few years ago. I think it seems, for me, it seems to be working better. Um, <clears throat> lots of people talking about Rings of Power. Um, uh, I mean, I, th I think, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of people having the same kind of feeling there is that Yes, it's not it's not a strong adaptation of Tolkien, um, which some people means that they don't want to watch it, but it's got a lot of uh, good things about it too. Um, uh, Reflective Rambling saying, speaking of Bear, is there any news on part two of the Bear um, interview that was teased? Um, uh, there are some middle ways, and you also love something and see flaws. Yeah, the, the ability to love something and see flaws is, is I think, a really important part of humanity. Um, in in terms of the bear, yeah, you're you're talking about. The, so this is the composer um, of uh, the music for the Rings of Power. Um, I did do the follow up. Um, do feel free to go and have a look for it. It is, I think, it's on the main channel. I might bring them over onto this channel, um, IDG Live. Um, but yeah, I did the follow up. The, the reason why was that, um, he teased and when I, I did a first interview with him, um, I can't remember it was, it was before the show dropped or a couple of episodes in or something. And I 
I asked him <clears throat> something about the One Ring theme or something like that, and he said, "Oh yes, it's it's in it's in there, but you'll never guess where it is or something along those lines." And he said. Uh, he he promised to come back for a second interview and reveal a bit more, which he did. And and actually, if if you that was actually one of the those two interviews I did, um, I found fascinating. And the kind of thing actually on this channel I'd like to do a little bit more of is getting somebody who's actually involved in this world um, uh, outside of whatever you might think about the Rings of Power. We'd be having a bit of a debate about that here, but whatever the creation, the 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 process of creation of music for a tv show it, it was absolutely mind-blowing for me absolutely fascinating the way that he he created these building blocks um uh and could then describe it and the passion that he had in those interviews i thought worked in, that they there were some of the things i was most proud of uh being able to share with people um so yeah do go and check them out the second part is is out there somewhere on on my, my main channel <clears throat> uh, AAK, thank you very much for the super sticker. I appreciate that. Um, uh, um, let's go to um, oh, Reflect Rambling saying sounds like a potential idea to collab with Costume CO since she has her contacts has been doing designer interviews yeah maybe i'll do a do that let me let me know the kind of things I, I there are a few ideas i've got going on there um i'd like to do some um uh interviews with people in the wider kind of world maybe some tolkien scholars maybe uh some people who've like directed some episodes of Game of Thrones or something like that. Um, maybe some people who are involved in publishing um, th so that we can sort of understand the process. I mean, I'd love to sort of understand the process when, assuming we ever do, we get the word of the Winds of Winter is going to be published or has been finished. What's the next step? How does the publication go? That kind of thing I would, I would find fascinating. Um, but anyway, let me know if that's the kind of thing you might find interesting on here. Um, let's go to uh, question from uh, Diego Godoy uh, saying, Hola Robert, would you mind sharing a sentence from A Song of Ice and Fire that you find emotional? For me, a very poignant one is when Maester Eamon is about to die in his travels with Sam and Gilly, and he says, Egg, I dreamed that I was old. Just an old man imagining he's with his beloved long gone brother. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that is an incredibly uh, emotive, sad, um, uh, bittersweet. Uh, line. Um, I would love to know in the chat, I'll read a few of them out, if, if there's a line which strikes you. And, and again, this is one of those things where uh, every time I engage with a song of ice, another line, um, I don't know whether this is my favourite, but it's one that struck me quite recently. Igrit talking to John and she says, you're mine, mine as I'm yours. And if we die, we die. All men must die, Jon Snow. But first, we'll live. And I, I just find, given what we know is about to happen to both of them, I just find that incredibly poignant um, that, you know, we're, we're going to die, but we have to live. Uh, yeah. But let me know if there's a, um, a great uh, little uh, sort of line. Uh, Kais Bellarina says, not my hair. Ned loves my hair. Um I'm you, writ small. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, great line. Um, let's go to Milton Christopher Appling, uh, saying, Hi, Robert. Um, regarding Mushroom and Fire and Blood, do you believe that we are supposed to take him at face value? I've always imagined him more as the old conceit of Shakespeare, that he was a stand-in for a member of the royal court. I just don't see Yildane taking a fool seriously enough to include, unless, as is obvious, he has ulterior motives. But he also includes mushroom story versions that counter his own narratives. So while he's obviously unreliable, what can we take from that? Or is George R. R. Martin simply taking advantage for exposition? Um, I mean, this is partly George R. R. Martin, we have to be honest. Partly George R. R. Martin wanting 
to show a slightly different side. If this was just the Maesters with their slightly fuddy-duddy ways telling the story, it wouldn't be as fun for us to read. So the inclusion of Mushroom in Fire and Blood Part 1 is definitely there to give us uh, to, or to give the narrative a little bit more flavour, let's put it that way. And also sometimes to give us a possibility of what happened that is not just what the maesters think. Um, so, uh, yeah, th there is a narrative. But is there a sort of a, an, an extra layer to this? Is this something that in-world Gildane included um, in a... In a for a particular reason i mean I, I don't i don't think so i i think it's just it is fair that he he has a number of different um sources and he mushrooms sources my, this is my take my in world take is that mushroom stories are well known throughout the land he published them people got to know them and so Gildane has to acknowledge that they're there. He has to accept the fact that this is what people say, um, and so he can't always just rubbish them. Um, he has to sort of treat them with some sort of scholarly respect, but most of the time he's saying, well, no, obviously that's clearly rubbish. We're going to go with this. Uh, but I think that Gildane, despite himself, on a couple of occasions, he sort of says, well, this is a possibility. Um because he was there and our other witnesses, our other sources weren't there. So um, that's my sort of in-world understanding of it, is that whereas these kind of like the the notes of previous maesters and, and uh, septons and things like that, they might be known to a few other people in the trade. Out in the wider world, the only stories which people will have heard will have been from Mushroom. So he has to... Um, include them in some way or acknowledge them um uh, let's i'm just having a quick flick through um show only says i indie some people will always need help that doesn't mean they aren't worth helping from mira yeah that's a lovely one um uh she kind of forgot about year on tester yeah um not in the book. Um, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, said Jojum. The man who never reads lives only one. Never forget what you were, what you are, as the world will for sure not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of a um, uh, lot of great quotes there. Um, let's go to Lady Pushkins. Um, do you think Melisandre could be light bringer and bring the dawn or light? Um, I mean, this is a, a, a theory that I've, I've sort of seen it out there on and off. Um, the the argument sort of goes so Stannis and or um, John are Azora High, and they need to have a sword, um, uh, and she is the sword. Uh, it's figurative, um, and that's what we're looking at. Now, um, is there much backing this up? Well, we it's described, Lightbring is described as the red sword of heroes, and she's clearly the red woman. Uh, so you have to hold a sword. She quite often says, take my hand to people. Um, Lightbringer, quite a bit was made, particularly with Maester Eamon, about the idea that... Um, uh, uh, it has to radiate heat, and the sword that she says is like bringer doesn't radiate heat. However, she does. Um, uh, she is her body is hot. Um, so uh, the, the, all these things you can bring up as an argument. I mean, I think the the thing about uh, and I've said this. This is one of the one of the earliest kind of um, attempts at pith summary of. Um, uh, the literary analysis of, of, of Azor Ahai is that even after the I humbly predict, even after we have the winds of winter and a dream of spring, we will still be arguing in the Asunga Bison community who Azor Ahai is and what 
Nightbringer is. Um, George R. R. Martin is not just writing like a, a simple, here's a prophecy, this is the person who fulfills the prophecy, and that's the end of the story. We will still be debating it, and there will be many different interpretations, and they're all going to be right to some degree. Do I think that this is the straightforward answer? Is she Lightbringer? No. But I think that you can, from a literary perspective, you will be able to say, because because I think um, Lightbringer the Sword is most likely to be Dawn the Sword, as an aside. But do I think from a literary perspective you could argue that she takes on the role of Lightbringer? Yeah, I think you can certainly argue that. Um, uh, Devoted to Maria says she smells like the forge at Winterfell, according to John, which is very Nisa Nisa. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are things um, that uh, that could work with uh, with it you could if you wish to interpret it that way it, i think it's entirely uh, um legitimate interpretation um keith boynton hi robert hope you had a wonderful holiday i did thank you in your live stream on maester aemon a few months ago you offhandedly mentioned a common belief among the fandom that westeros operates in a kind of closed historical loop can you elaborate on that i know there's a lot of cyclical stuff going on but it sounds like you were hinting at something more all-encompassing now i can't remember exactly what i was saying in that particular live stream i have to say but um probably what i was talking about was um, the idea that time could operate. This is all very conceptual. And whenever you get to like fantasy worlds and things where you get time travel, it starts to get quite head spinny very quickly, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, and all of that. But um, in this world, George R. Martin could have taken it in a number of different ways. If somebody goes back in time, and we'll talk about examples of what I mean by that in a moment, but if somebody goes back in time, changes something, he could have said, okay, so that opens up a new timeline over there, um, and then we're going to be on that timeline over there. Or he could say that that doesn't work at all. He could say in, in the way the show puts it the ink is dry you cannot change the past at all we're just stuck on this one line and you can't change a thing at all um there are a number of different approaches you could take to this um the way that george R. R. martin seems to have done this as as a concept for how his universe works is what i call um a, a closed time loop now, that might not be what you would call it, um, but I'll try and explain what I mean by that. Uh, what I mean is that, contrary to what Blood Raven tries to teach Bran, he says you can't change the past, basically. Bran has his first weirwood vision. He sees his father. He sees through the weirwood tree in Winterfell, and he sees his father sitting there, and he calls out to him. And Ned turns around and says, who's there? That is Bran in the future talking in the past to his father and changing the past in a very small way. Ned turned around. He said, who's there? Um, there's no response. He just carried on with whatever he was doing. Um, that is a closed time loop in as much as that always happened that had been that had happened in the past by the time that bran was going through was was looking through the weirwood tree in the future um but he caused it to happen in the future by going back through to the past if that makes sense it's a it's a, a line of causality that is in a loop um the the next step on from that is Hodor. Now, George R. Martin has all but confirmed that what we saw on the TV show was pretty much what we're talking about in the books. The details will be different when he's talking about hold the door. He doesn't necessarily mean actually hold the door. Maybe it's like hold the doorway um, in a kind of like a defensive position. That kind of level of detail isn't important as far as this is concerned. What we're talking about here is the fact that what Bran does is he goes into the past 
to when Hodor was young. He walks into him then, says, hold the door. And that is telling Hodor in the future to be holding the door, but also in the past. And that is breaking Hodor's brain. He wasn't called Hodor at the time. Breaking Hodor's brain in a way that means that from that moment on, the only thing that he says is Hodor. It's a closed time loop because by the time that has happened in the past, it has been caused by something which happens in the future. So all the way through to the point at, the point at which Bran does that, Bran causes it to happen, it has already happened in the past. It is a closed time loop. Now, the, the intriguing part for me is that seems to be how George R. R. Martin has set up this world is that the things that you might cause in the future have already happened in the past. Um, is the Hodor thing the culmination of that? Is the the Ned, what happened with Ned turning around, who's there, is that the proof of concept and then the big reveal is Hodor? Or is there going to be one bigger step after that? Is Bran, for example, going to do something even bigger and go into the past to cause something that has already happened. That's the that's the question that I have going into this. I think we've got a clear understanding of how George R. R. Martin is working that concept of how you deal with changing the past from the future. Uh, it's a matter of what that means for the story. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, Ricardo, saludos, Robert, uh, and to you too. Has there ever been a manifestation of the seven gods power something like we've seen from the lord of light or the old gods um i mean it depends on who you talk about uh, or who you ask really um the short answer which i think you will know instinctively already is that whereas there are many clear examples you could say for say uh, the Lord of Light, the Red God, you say, here's Melisandre doing magic in his name. There aren't, and as you say, the old gods, we, we can see sort of the weirwoods are magic. Um, can we point to any clear, explicit example of the faith of the seven doing, a, saying a thing and then it happening? Um, no. Are there examples that they would look to and say this is our god working yes uh in healing um in seeking wisdom uh in more sort of low-key day-to-day ways that is what they would argue um it's not all about the showiness this is about um their god working through um uh stuff you could for example um the the chapter the davos chapter where he survives um uh, the battle of the black water that is an incredibly religious faith of the seven religious chapter now you can read that as just him uh slowly going a little bit crazy thinking back to what had happened um, and then stun a, a ship comes close, hailing it, getting its attention. Or you could read it from the way that he is interpreting it, which is that this is him, basically, he's always been a follower of the faith of the seven, and he's basically saying, if you rescue me, then I'm going to go and do such and such a thing, and then suddenly a ship appears, this is a miracle. Um, so he that's the way he interprets it. Um George R. Martin does not say to us at any point in any of these things, this is this God working in that way. Even the things that Melisandre does, yes, she says this is all the Red God, but the possibility is there that she just knows a few good magic tricks and says that this is the Red God. So um, George R. Martin has said we'll never see the gods in... A Song of Ice and Fire, and we also won't ever see 100% proof that this is the gods doing things. Um, but undoubtedly, the Faith of the Seven um, has got fewer examples of obvious magic associated with them. Um, Mike, can I say hi, Robert, late to the stream? Just a thanks today. Well, thank you very much. 
Um, and what should go to a question from Catherine Furseth saying, um, it's been a while since we talked about the Night's Watch. We keep discussing whether the North remembers, but how about the Watch? What is your current thinking about their original purpose when they were formed? And also what their role historically is in the new long night. Are we to take their watcher role literally, meaning they are the world's eyes towards the north, alerting the world about the coming of the others, or do they have a more specific role in defeating them? Um, Mr. Eamon must have read most of the old rare books in the library, but he didn't convey to others any special knowledge about the others. So what has the Night's Watch forgotten? Will they remember in time or will they fail, causing the wall to fall? A um, lot of really good questions. Um, the, the Night's Watch, um, I think clearly they were set up around the time after as the wall in order to protect the people south of the wall from potential um, attack from the north. Um, what I'd love to do is just very quickly go over the Night's Watch Oath, which is really interesting to, to read. So here goes. Night gathers, and now my watch begins. It shall not end until my death. I shall take no wife, hold no lands, father no children. I shall wear no crowns and win no glory. I shall live and die at my post. I am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. I pledge my life and honour to the Night's Watch for this night and all the nights to come. I read that out because you can break that down easily into three sections. <clears throat> and I had... We have talked about the speed of lands. I had uh, her on many years ago talking about this, and um, we were working through. This doesn't feel like one cohesive oath. It feels like an old bit and a, a tagged on bit. The, the bit at the end, the last line is that's the that oath. I pledge my life and honor for this night and all nights to come. That's the sort of the ending bit. Then you get the beginning bit uh, where it's like a, a series of promises of things that you know you're going to be doing uh, that i'll take no wife hold no lands father no children etc etc those those are just the duties that feels like perhaps a later add-on the older bit feels like the the imagery this is the feel of what they're about. I am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. All of these things, we could dig into exactly what each of them mean, but the feel is very much the same. They are the, they are the people watching out for the next long night. They are the humanity's first line of defense. Um, shield guarding the realms of men. Horn that wakes the sleepers. There may well be other layers to this, but people are, are there. They need somebody to wake them up when the threat uh, comes. Uh, the light that brings the dawn, the fire that burns against the cold. This is things against the long night. The watcher on the walls, the people keeping an eye out. The sword in the darkness, the darkness again with the long night. This is the feel that we have. These are the people who are there, the first line of defense against humanity. And that we've got this clear understanding of this. What the Night's Watch have forgotten is the, the the bit about the others because the others have descended into myth and legend so they now think about themselves mostly many of them protecting against the wildlings they're still thinking that they're protecting the realms of men but against other men uh, so what have they forgotten well the kinds of things that um blood raven seems to be trying to remind them about the role of dragon glass here's a horn probably the horn of winter he provides them with that 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 bundle of stuff that ghost finds uh, to defeat them with fire these are the kinds of things that they are um have forgotten because they shifted their attention from protecting against the others to uh protecting against the wildlings so that's um 
that's that bit. Maester Eamon seemed to have focused most of his attention not so much on that side of practicalities, but think trying to think about the the prophecies from the Targaryen perspective with the prince that was promised. Um, uh, how do we get this leader from the south, not just the Night's Watch, but this leader from the south who's going to unite the Seven Kingdoms? So that's that's where that's why Maester Eamon has perhaps not been focused as much on what about the uh, the uh, the Night's Watch role against the others because he's thinking about the prince that was promised. Um, and Andrew Kay, you're right. It doesn't help that the Night's Watch knowledge continuity for generations are being supplied by regions mostly sending their worst. The priorities have been skewed. Yeah, so this is not the best. Uh, Lady Pushkins, uh, good night. Uh, great to see you. Um, how are we doing on time? We've been going for a while. We've got... Um, let's see how we go. Jordi Seriani, Happy New Year, Robert. I hope you're feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. I am. Why did Dark Star attack Marcella? If he is to become a King's Guard and all the Sword of the Morning, what ramifications will this act have? Um, okay, so Dark Star, this is uh, later on in the story. This is book only, not show. Dark Star is um, from a cadet branch of House Dane. Gerald Dane is his name. He is part of Ariane's team. Ariane um, Martell. Um, is one of those who's getting frustrated with Doran Martell, who's working very slowly. The, the Martells as a whole hate the Lannisters. Um, uh, and Ariane is there trying to rush things along. Get the Lannisters out of power. How do we do this? Well, her cunning plan is they've got Marcella, um, uh, who is a Lannister, but yeah, quite a good one. Um, and her plan is to say, well, under Dornish law, once Joffrey died, she's the next oldest, she should rule. Um, and so she's got Marcella and she's going to champion Marcella, thinking that, OK, we can we can provoke a war between the Lannisters and Dawn. Because she thinks that Dawn will come in behind her and uh, Marcella, because Dawn as a whole hates um, uh, the Lannisters, this kind of like sidelines uh, Doran Martell. He's going to be forced into uh, supporting this. That's her cunning plan. She gets a whole load of, I mean, hotheads basically alongside her people who aren't willing to wait for Doran's cunning plans to come to fruition. One of these people is Darkstar, Gerald Dane. Um, when they come up against uh, a bit of a problem um he decides to, it would appear uh, that the easiest way to prompt a war between the lannisters and the uh, dawn is actually not this idea of well we'll put up an alternative ruler but we could kill Marcella. Uh, the Lannisters would hate that, or they would declare war on Dawn. So he cuts her, basically, he cuts her ear off um, uh, before running away. Um, we will see more of him. Why did he do that? It's because, as far as we can tell, because he thought uh, amongst this cr this crew who've come up with this crazy plan, because uh, they thought that. Uh, um, Doran Martell's plans weren't working quick enough. Uh, Ariane came up with a quicker plan. He thought that her plan wasn't working quick enough, so he went for an even more drastic plan. Um, is this going to affect things longer term? Quite possibly. Um, it'll be interesting to see him meet up again with Ariane if he does, because the the working theory amongst much of the Song of Ice and Fire community is that it kind of makes sense for him to join um, the Kingsguard of Fagon, God me, of Fagon's Kingsguard, um, and perhaps even steal Lightbringer uh, to be a kind of an echo then of the um, the classic Kingsguard of Eris the Second, which obviously had Arthur Dane in it. So um, might that be a problem? Yes, in as much as Ariane looks like she may go and join Team Fagon. Um, so, yeah, basically he's just being 
a hot head <laughs> and just doing what he thinks is uh, is is right. He is almost going to very likely to steal light, bring up, bring that into play. Um, I don't think he's long for the world. Um, I don't think he's an end game character, but he is important enough that George R. R. Martin created him when he realised that the character he originally wanted to do that when he abandoned this five year gap, five year time gap that uh, was there that he'd originally planned on. Um, uh, he was going to have Ned Dane do these things. Um, he could have just abandoned that plot line. Instead, he said, nope, I'm going to do it. I'm going to create an entirely new character to do those things. So he thinks this is going to be important. So he is going to have an important role, but I don't think he's long for the world after that. Johnny Sariani also asking, why did Tywin never remarry? Uh, with one son in the King's Guard and the other never really in consideration for inheritance anyway, it seems his line would die with him, though not the Lannister name. Was he always planning to annul Jamie's position, or is this just another sign of his hypocrisy? Um, uh, yes, it's a sign of his hypocrisy. Um, the thing is, he's not... In, in an odd way, he's a bit of a softie at heart. He was madly in love with his wife, Joanna. Um, everybody says this. Um, he, She used to make him laugh and smile. Um, uh, we're told that he ruled the Seven Kingdoms, but she ruled him. Um, uh, so he was absolutely crazy about her and didn't want to remarry, I think is the short answer. Um, he was all for the, you must do your duty to be supporting your House Lannister. But yes, this is hypocritical. Really doing his duty, he should have remarried and had more Lannister children, particularly when it becomes clear Jaime is in the Kingsguard. And if he didn't want Tyrion to be inheriting, um, and Cersei is obviously uh, married to the king, he, he never even makes it clear who the heir is. Now, I, I think you're right, though, that his plan, and he had huge self-confidence, it was never that Robert Baratheon would stay on the throne. Um, uh, I think it was at some point Robert Baratheon would die, and then Cersei, uh, well, Joffrey would inherit, and uh, Cersei would be Queen Regent, and he would basically rule through them, and in that he could release Jamie from his uh, vows, and um, then Jamie could be, uh, in, well, he could inherit. Uh, that's certainly he tries to do this when Jamie arrives back, when the, the 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 option is is there for well, not the option is there when uh, the occasion arises. Jamie uh, having broken free from captivity when Cat had set him free and he does the epic road trip with Brienne and he ends up back down in King's Landing. He's lost his hand on the way. Um, uh, Jamie goes to see his father and pretty much the first thing his father says is, okay, great, you're back. Um, now it's time to free you from uh, your vows and you're going to go and I'll find you somebody to marry and you're going to be inheriting and da da da. And he just basically, he tells um, Jamie, what's going to happen next in his life? And Jamie just says no. Uh, this is a huge thing. I think we think we we overlook this a lot. We we tend to think of Jamie as this kind of move against his family as, as happening once he's gone away from King's Landing. Actually, those couple of chapters when he arrives back, um, the amount of characters he he splits basically from his family at that point. Um, he splits from the Kingsguard. He realizes, he comes back, he realizes that he didn't, these these people he doesn't know. Half of the, the Kingsguard, he's, he's the Lord Commander now, but who are these guys? They're new appointments. He doesn't rate them. He doesn't like them. Um, then he sees Cersei and basically um, he tries to force himself on her. Um, uh, but uh, she's um, uh, she doesn't, and, and he sort of says, "Now, hey, now we can be together and uh, forget everyone else. They all know that we're together anyway. Let's just marry." And she's like, "No, uh, that's a break." There, uh, Tywin says, 
you're going to do all of these things and he says no and Tywin we, we often overanalyze the the line when he says to Tyrion you're no son of mine he says that exact same thing to Jamie. he says you're no son of mine um or you're not my son um and then he releases Tyrion from jail uh from the back cells and Tyrion by this point and he feels he has to come clean about that thing in the past with Tisha and um uh Tyrion just lays into him and just rejects him uh and heads out and he at this point Jamie's connection to his family it's not permanently severed at that point but that is the important turning point that was a digression well where did i get to that from um uh, was he always planning to annul jamie's position yes i think is the short answer uh, but it is a sign of his hypocrisy because he could have done he could have remarried himself um that's my questions from my patrons about a song of ice and fire feel free to drop more song of ice and fire questions in the chat um uh, let's we can make this an epic session why not let's go we got a few lord of the rings questions i promised i would get to them as well uh matthew hawkins saying in the lord of the rings uh, why did gandalf and aragorn decide to take Gollum all the way to thranduil in northern mirkwood when aragorn could have delivered him to nearby lothlorien where galadriel could have used her telepathy skills to read his mind this is uh the sort of the the stuff that happens just before the main story in um the Lord of the Rings. Um, we get Gandalf after he's um, he's just got really suspicious about this ring that Bilbo's got, um, and he sort of goes off investigating. And in in the films, him going off investigating is basically him riding to Minas Tirith, looking at a few old documents, and going, "Aha!" Um, in the in the books, it's a lot more in depth than that. But uh, he gets uh, Gandalf is a bit suspicious to start with, um, and so he does a little bit of tracking of uh, uh, Gollum, and then he kind of like loses him and he sort of gives up for a while, um, years in fact, uh, and then he starts getting suspicious again about Bilbo, um, and then he goes off this like 16 year epic hunt with Aragorn. He takes Aragorn. Aragorn does a whole load of the hunting. Aragorn finally captures um, Gollum and takes him up to uh, Thranduil in Mirkwood, uh, Legolas's dad. Um, and the question is why? Why Why there? Why did he take him all the way there? Uh, it was closer. Lothlorien was closer. Uh, Galadriel, you could trust her. Uh, Thranduil, yeah, maybe you can't quite trust him as much. Uh, well, I've got, uh, I think I've got a clear answer to this one. Uh, so this is Gandalf talking in the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf talking about the first when he was first trying to find Gollum. He says, the wood elves tracked him first, an easy task for them, for his trail was still fresh then. Through Mirkwood and back again it led them, though they never caught him. The wood was full of the rumour of him, dreadful tales even among beasts and birds. The woodman said that there was some new terror abroad, a ghost that drank blood. It climbed trees to find nests, it crept into holes to find the young, it slipped through windows to find cradles. But at the western edge of Mirkwood the trail turned away. It wandered off southwards and passed out of the wood elves' ken, and was lost. Well, what happened there? So, um, Bilbo, sorry, Bilbo took the ring from, um, uh, well, he found the ring, obviously, but basically stole it from Gollum. Uh, and then he escapes the Misty Mountains, but the, the light is too much for Gollum. And as much as he wants to get, come after Bilbo straight away, he can't, he can't leave. Uh, Eventually, though, he does pluck up the courage and he heads out um, and he tries to track Bilbo. And he does track Bilbo. He tracks him uh, down from the Misty Mountains through Mirkwood all the way up to Erebor. 
Um, and then he tracks him all the way back again. So he gets goes up to the Lonely Mountain, heads and then tracks him all the way back on his route back home, back through Mirkwood, at which point something interesting happens, because surely he would have carried on tracking Bilbo all the way he all the way back to the Shire. But at that point, Sauron announces himself again in Mordor. And he basically he summons unto himself, you know, all of the the bad and nasty things in the world, all of the things which pay him obeisance. Um, and Gollum gets kind of sucked towards Mordor. He gets sucked towards Sauron because because of his ring dependence, and um, that's when Sauron captures him tortures him, finds out the words Baggins and Shire, um, and then releases him again. Now, all of that time, not all of that time, but a huge amount of that time, Aragorn's been hunting around, trying to find where Gollum is. Um, then he captures him just outside um, Mordor, and he takes him up to Thranduil. Um, why? Well, this is what he says. I brought him there at last and gave him to the elves, for we had agreed that this should be done. So the simple boring answer to all of that, which is uh, it was quite a long answer to get there, but the simple boring answer is the elves, the, the wood elves, Thranduil's people, started helping out Gandalf. Um, and when Aragorn sort of heads off without Gandalf trying to find Gollum, they prearranged what he would do with it. They'd prearranged that wherever, they didn't know where he was going to find uh, Gollum, they'd prearranged that he would bring him to Thranduil. Um, and because Thranduil had been involved at the beginning of this hunt in some way, and that was where they would do their interrogation of him. So that's where Gandalf came in, in as well. Um, could they have taken him to Lothlorien? Yes, but Gandalf, that wasn't where Gandalf had agreed to go to. Um, would it have made a difference if they'd done it, taken Gollum there? Well, I, I don't think, as, as wonderful and powerful as Gladriel is, I don't think that her ability to sort of read minds is any particularly greater than the Maya, uh, who is Gandalf, um, who has lots of abilities in, in that regard. We don't, again, I did a video on that a long time ago, um, but he's, he definitely has the power to read minds. So um, I'm afraid it's a boring answer. It's just because that's where they agreed they would go and they didn't know where they would find him, but they knew that he was at some point in North Mirkwood. Rita M saying, um, hey, Robert, this is a Lord of the Rings question. Is there any theory about how Deagle found the ring? Uh, did Ulmo bring it to the surface or guide the hooked fish past it? It seems like it was an appropriate time for it to surface as opposed to Saruman finding it later. And obviously, Ulmo didn't see the need to flush it out into the sea, which presumably he could have done. Okay, so Ulmo is the Lord of the Valar in charge of the waters, um, who, although the Valar had largely removed themselves from Middle-earth, he did retain an interest. Was he involved in this? Personally, I think, although, yes, I think you're right, probably he did see the bigger picture of things and perhaps understand that the ring needed to come out. It needed to find its way to um, uh, to people who could destroy it, and it's much better to, for the Hobbit-type characters, uh, Deagle and Smeagol, to find it than Saruman. I think all of that is definitely true, but I think we need to understand the context here, which is... Um, long time before this, in the year 2063, um, Sauron had been hiding, basically, in South Mirkwood, in Dol Guldur, and under the name The Necromancer. And in 2063, Gandalf had got so suspicious of this mysterious necromancer person that he went to investigate and Sauron fled. He he wasn't strong enough yet. He fled. Um, he left Dol Guldur, and what followed was 500 years or so of what became known as the Watchful Peace. Where Sauron went, who knows? He disappeared. But he returned. And he returned in the year 
two four six zero. So yeah, it was four hundred years of watchful peace. The piece, the year two four six zero. He returns to Dol Guldur. Now Dol Guldur is in the southwest corner of Mirkwood, and not too far away to the west of that is the River Anduin, which is where the ring was found three years later. The timing is almost too coincidental for me, is that the ring sensed his return, uh, sensed that he was powerful enough he, he to perhaps now uh, use it. He didn't have to flee immediately before uh, Gandalf or anyone like that. Um, and so the ring at that point wanted to be found. And it was then just a matter of when is there somebody nearby that bit of the river who would find it. So that's the, the look. I don't think it was Ulmo. I think it worked with Ulmo's bigger plans, but I, I think this was, this was the ring sensing Sauron's presence. Um, Mara Lee, um, uh, I understand that the Rings of Power TV show will have a second season and it will be broadcast this year. Have you heard when? What characters and story arcs are you most looking forward to seeing? Um, and do you think we will learn who the stranger is this coming season? Um, uh, it's the stranger and how Halbrand will deal with Adar that I'm most interested in. Do you think we'll see the forging of more rings, especially the one ring in this second season? Um, so to answer these questions, uh, yes, they have finished filming it. It's in post-production uh, for reasons that I haven't yet managed to understand. Amazon's post-production for the Lord of the, or the Rings of Power takes a lot longer than, say, HBO's does for an equivalent season of House of the Dragon or Game of Thrones. I think it was 13 months post-production for the first season of um, the Rings of Power. I don't know how long this one's going to be, but they finished filming a few months ago. I am expecting it late summer, early autumn, something like that. Uh, so... Um, quite a long way away. I think they got a bit stung from the fact that they, when Rings of Power Season 1 was going to come out, they announced the date over a year in advance, the date that they were going to go live with it. Uh, and then HBO decided they were going to launch House of the Dragon two weeks before that. Uh, get all of the headlines. Uh, everybody watched the first couple of episodes of House of the Dragon, loved that. Um, and then comes Rings of Power. And I think Amazon were a bit annoyed by that. Um, so I think this time they're holding back. They're going to wait and see when House of the Dragon happens, and then they'll decide when to launch it on the basis of that information. Uh, so I think we're not going to have the two go head to head, I hope. Fingers crossed. Uh, it might just be me wanting it because um, nearly killed me trying to cover two shows at the same time last time. Uh, I hope that they don't run uh, at the same time again this time. Anyway, uh, what happens uh, in season two? Will we learn who the stranger is? I think they will give us more hints, but I think they like the fact that he is a mystery. Um, uh, I agree how Halbrand slash Sauron deal with Adar is going to be fascinating. I'm really looking forward to that. Will we see the forging of more rings? Well, they've they've changed the order of and the how and why the rings were forged. Um, so I, I don't think we can really go by what Tolkien's um, events were there. But I think that they will definitely... We will see the rings get forged this year. The rest of the rings get forged this year. Um, for those who don't know, in the Rings of Power, we saw the forging of the three elven rings uh, in season one. Uh, in the Silmarillion, it's very clear those were the last rings to get forged, um, uh, not the, the the nine and the seven happened first. Um, for, so... Uh, your guess is as good as mine on that one. Uh, Nick from NJ saying, Hannah Robert, uh, greetings to all. My question is about the Stone of Erendil, the Elf Stone, Galadriel's gift to Aragorn as they've departed Lothlorien to continue their quest. It's clearly important to both Aragorn, who wears it, um, and more generally, uh, he's encouraged to take it as a token of hope. And it's a bride gift. Uh, showing approval from Galadriel, showing approval of Aragorn's match with Lady Arwen. It carries a reputation as a talisman. Um, 
So, um, the, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find the question. Um, later, while on the river, Frodo makes a similar observation. Is it possible that in addition to its other virtues, the elf stone is a glamour because uh, it makes him look more tall and kingly? Um, and that to them, uh, many years of toil had fallen from Aragorn's shoulders when he wore it. Well, so it has many virtues, the elf stone. Uh, healing powers is one of them. Um, it's not 100% clear whether this is the, the original elf stone, which was forged way back in time, or a later one that Caleb Bimbor, uh forged. But either way, it seems to have healing powers, which we see Aragorn then use in the Houses of Healing later in Minas Tirith, which helps prove his kingship. Um, it's said to have the pure light of the sun trapped within it. Um, and also uh, that any who look upon the stone... Or, or, or look through the stone, could see withered and aged things as whole and young again. So that's what we're told. So if Aragorn is wearing it, he's got the light of the sun, the pure sun, uh, the holy sun upon him. And it's got this, you can see the younger uh, things where you get age there. So he will look younger. He will, it's not a glamour per se, but it will make him look younger. It will look him, make him look, less haggard by the years of being a ranger and sleeping rough all that time. Um, uh, Kingdom of the Source. Um, I've been rereading The Lord of the Rings and just finished The Two Towers. Would a mortal live forever if they stayed in Lothlorien while Galadriel had the ring? Um, oh, well, it's an interesting question. I think the answer is no. It's his preservative power. So the ring of power that she had... It had preservative powers. But if this is like the Undying Lands, the important thing about the Undying Lands is that the lands themselves are undying, not the people who are in the lands. It doesn't make you undying but just because you were there. And I think the same principle would apply here in Lothlorien. Um, it, it, you would you would get rest and you you would uh, it's all good things um uh, and you would probably live a longer life and a happier life and a more relaxed life but it would not make you immortal also do you think the old man in robes that gimli legolas and Sa and aragorn saw could have been another wizard who is neither gandalf nor saruman and well, it's an interesting question so this is um when aragorn legolas and gimli enter fangorn <coughs> they see an, a wizard, white robes um, and a hat, and they're not sure who this is. They, they wonder whether this might be Saruman. And then later Gandalf reveals himself to them, and it's like, aha, you're the wizard in white, and uh, so that must have been you we saw the other day. And Gandalf said, no, not me. Um, so... The working assumption here is that it was indeed Saruman that they saw, um, not Gandalf, because Gandalf denies it. The, the possibility is Gandalf was a bit confused. Um, he'd just come back from the dead. He didn't even know his name or anything else, uh, So, uh, or what he was doing there. So that's a possibility. Um, Christopher Tolkien, who we should probably... Um, accept as being an authority on all of these things. He'd gone through all of his father's notes and he said that, uh, yes, this is a bit of a mystery, but as far as he could work out in the early drafts, uh, Tolkien had intended this to be Gandalf, but then for later drafts, changed his mind and it was Saruman. So that is perhaps where the confusion comes in and why it's not 100% clear to some people on their first read through um is it is it could it have been someone else i mean i don't think so um is the short answer um it, it'd be a struggle to think of who else it could be um it's basically it's set up as this idea of gandalf taking over from saruman so this first figure is in a kind of literary way, uh, Gandalf comes back and sort of says, you know, I am 
Saruman, or at least as Saruman as he ought to have been. Uh, so he is he's not just getting promotion and a new set of robes. He is conceptually what Saruman ought to have been. So they see the old Saruman, and then they see the new Gandalf. And this this is a kind of a literary way of shifting our focus to understand a little bit better what it is that's actually going on with Gandalf. Um, Johnny Sariani, Glamdring, Orchrist, and Sting. That's Those are the swords, if you remember, um, that Gandalf and Thorin and Bilbo found in the Troll Horde uh, and then used through the Hobbit. Um, they were all made and used in Gondolin, we are told. Since they were likely stolen by looters and found by Gandalf and Thorin thousands of years later, we can assume that their owners fell in the battle. If we also consider that Balrogs were present during Gondolin's form, uh, fall, is it possible that Durin's bane was there as well, perhaps even facing off against someone wielding Glamdring? If so, this would mean Gandalf used the very same sword to kill it thousands of years later. Are there any holes in this that I've overlooked? No, there are no, no holes in that. So yeah, these are ancient swords from the ancient elf um, secret city of Gondolin. Um, the fall of Gondolin is one of the key parts of the Silmarillion, one of the three great stories of the First Age. Um, and uh, when it fell... It, Huge heroic deeds were done. This was when Glorfindel fought the Balrog. Um, it, it's um, it's time of horror uh, for those who were there. A small number managed to escape, but basically uh, Morgoth sent his entire forces swarming against uh, them. Dragons and Balrogs and Orcs and every nasty thing all descended there on Gondolin. And what we're told is that, yes, some of these swords must have been looted from there by some orcs or other, and then at some point over thousands of years, they ended up in the possession of those trolls um, that uh, were defeated in The Hobbit. So, uh, could Durin's Bane have been there in the attack on um, Gondolin? Yeah. Uh, were those swords probably used in the fall of Gondolin? Yeah. Um, does this mean that Durin's Bane could have been used against... Uh, sorry, that one of those swords could have been used against Durin's Bane at the time? Yeah. Was it? We don't know. Um, but there's no reason why not. Okay, those are my three, uh, three, four uh, Lord of the Rings questions. Um, I can't see any more particular uh, Lord of the Rings questions in the chat. Uh, so let's go on. I've got two or three other random questions from my patrons. So let's go through them. Uh, Matthias Os saying Happy New Year, New Year, Robert. Is there anything, a TV show, movie, book, game, etc., that you are particularly looking forward to this year? Anything slightly lower profile that you think will be good that most might not be aware of? Well, I think I will just name check thing a few things you're probably aware of. But um, War of the Rohirrim anime, Lord of the Rings official Lord of the Rings film is coming out in December. Um, part of the team there, Philippa Boyens, who was uh, the person, we, we give Peter Jackson so much of the credit for the Lord of the Rings films, uh, Philippa Boyens was a hugely important part of that. She was the person who wrote a huge amount of the the great bits of dialogue that fitted in so well with Tolkien's way of speaking and uh, that we now just think that she was using Tolkien's words um, a lot of the time she was it was her <laughs> um, she did use Tolkien's words whenever possible but she did dra draft and create new uh, fantastic dialogue there um, so she's involved some other really good people involved some great voices uh, involved Brian Cox is involved Miranda Otto who was um, Eowyn uh, is involved I'm really looking forward to it um, it's based on proper talking story so um should be good 
uh, and they're told that they're making all the right mu music about this being very faithful. So very much looking forward to that. Um, also in December, we have another anime, uh, a Witcher anime uh, on Netflix. Um, the Witcher um, spin-offs have been a bit hit and miss. I think it's probably fair to say, but this one I'm quite looking forward to. This is, um, it's going to be called Sirens of the Deep. Uh, but is, as I understand it, an adaptation of the short story, A Little Sacrifice, um, which is a great short story, uh, and they didn't do it in the Witcher, main Witcher TV show. So I'm, I'm feeling hopeful that we might get, again, a good adaptation there. Um, so uh, I think they've got i might be wrong on this but i think they've got doug cockle who's the guy who does Geralt from the uh video games to be doing the voice there um so yeah i'm i'm looking forward to that one another couple of things just a silly thing what we do in the shadows i love that show i believe it's coming out um and i think there's a new season of foundation which i watched the first couple of episodes of really liked and haven't managed to get back to watch the rest of it uh but i hear only good things uh so that's um, uh, that's a few things I'm looking forward to this year. Um, Trevor saying, is this still going on? Yeah, we're still going on. We're nearly done. Um, uh, Andrew K saying, the Rohirrim is thankfully not in Amazon's hands. I suspect new line or Warner will easily do much better. Yeah, that's the other point I didn't mention. Yeah, so that is that's not an Amazon thing. That's uh, it's New Line Cinema and Warner, who are the people behind the Peter Jackson films, who are uh, involved in the War of the Rohirrim. Um, uh, Sittins for Sithis saying they need to do the Witcher justice. Uh, it's the best Slavic fantasy ever. Yeah, they. I, I, I've got high hopes for this one. I don't know whether that's fair, but I think that's. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, this this feels like they're going to do this one better than than some of the other adaptations. We'll see. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Martin S. Uh, saying, hello, Robert. Uh, hi there. Um, uh, happy New Year. I have come up with a word and a concept applicable to some fantasy and occasionally similar genres. I call it being shadow aligned. I mean that to be an adjective, and for it to be complementary to the adjective evil. Basically, I think evil is a slightly subjective way of communicating a certain status of character or being, and any fictional character who commits horrific acts can be argued to be evil. This concept would have the additional requirement that the person or being consciously and unapolog unapologetically serves the main evil force in the story. It implies a deeper connection to the main evil force in the fictional world, and it's not just a matter of committing heinous acts. As such, shadow-aligned characters and beings would basically always be evil and villainous, but not all evil or villainous characters or beings would be shadow-aligned. So Sauron and those who served uh, him would all be shadow-aligned. Um, I think it can be argued that more independent orcs also are, because they're deliberately... Um, deciding to to be serving evil uh Fëanor and his sons would would or could be villainous um and some of them arguably evil but not shadow aligned because they're not deliberately taking the side of the big bad evil thing um uh what do you think of this do you see how it might be slightly different um and it may not be all that fitting for George R. R. Martin's world, but I think it would work as a distinction from more classical fantasy. So I like that. I mean, I've tried to read out as much of that idea as possible. I think that this is um, a thing that often fantasy fiction does suffer from, is this idea that you have these are the bad and evil guys and those are the good guys, and they're just fighting each other. Um, and to make a distinction between people who do heinous acts and people who actively and you use the wheel of time as a good example here as well who actively choose to be supporting the evil person that's like shadow aligned i think that's a really good and important distinction to help us get a little bit more nuance there um i think uh when you get get into like things like sauron for example though i think that the, the, tolkien deliberately and it just this doesn't come across 
in most adaptations it's true but Tolkien was very clear that uh, Sauron didn't start off evil um, nor was his intent evil um, yes he aligned himself with Morgoth but at the same time uh, after his sort of repentance-ish moment at the beginning of the second age his intent was to do what he thought was right for middle earth um it's just that what he then thought he was the only person to do it and the only way to do that was through complete command and control and that was what led him to evil so i think that you get even in the fantasies that are that have more obvious good and evil you can have gradations within that about motivations and uh, Bushka Blue, last question from my patron, saying, have you read any of the Deveri or Deveri cycle books by Catherine Kerr? I find myself rereading them every few years. I have, but a very, very long time ago. At least I've read, I can remember Dagger Spell, uh, which I enjoyed at the time. Um, I thought it was um, uh, really fun. I haven't reread them, so I've no idea how well they've aged but i will take the recommendation and if i find them then i have and i have a bit of time i will get back into it um all right uh let's have a quick um uh, go through the chat um um duh, 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 duh. quick click through <laughs> Uh, Carl Karsnack saying, align yourself with the like and subscribe buttons. I see what you did there. Um, uh, there we go. So Tyrion, um, Tyrion went to King's Landing to get out of Tywin's control uh, to a degree. I'm not sure there was probably a little bit um, of a question there uh, before. Um, okay, I think with that, actually, I'm going to treat myself to uh, um, probably drawing this one to a close. Uh, now, what um, what's coming up uh, over? I've got a video coming out tomorrow, uh, which is, uh, what's that looking at? I think that's a Stannis one off the top of my head. Um, but uh, we will be getting back into regular uh two to three videos per week coming up very soon. I'm going to carry on with what I was doing for much of last year, which is some of my older videos I'm going to be redoing when I, if I feel that I've got new things to say, or I just feel that perhaps the production qualities on some of the older ones were uh, not as good, but that is not in any way going to be cutting down the amount of new videos um, I've got coming out. Short form videos, coming back onto this channel i'm also going to be doing some lore talk through video game playing so going through games uh for the connected to the worlds that we love here um and playing them but not as like a gamer playing them uh so much as talking my way through them explaining the background and the history and lore how this relates across to the books i'm really looking forward to doing that for a few different games um and a few interviews on here. Um, I've got a lot of big ideas coming uh, forward. What else have I got going on? The Well Told Tale, if you've not checked that one out, uh, that is um, me reading audiobooks. Uh, do go and uh, have a look at it. We're currently going through Dracula, which is a fantastic story. Um, so uh, do check that out. That's uh, both... Uh, a YouTube channel and as a podcast, if you'd rather hear your stories via podcast. Um, okay, I think that's probably it. Next week, what should we do next week? Um, I haven't decided. Tune in next week and find out. Um, but I will be getting back to doing these regularly, uh, weekly live streams. I will get Aziz back on. We're going to do the breakdown of A Storm of Swords, like I promised before Christmas. Um, and then we're going to get back into. Uh, on the Lord of the Rings side, we're going to be going through the rest of the Fellowship uh, one by one, uh, looking at them. And um, we were uh, looking at the North. Uh, we're going through some of the the interesting houses um, across Westeros and uh, where we left it. We did most of the houses, but I thought, well, we'll just do a wrap up, a roundup of the other houses in the North. Uh, so that's a uh, live stream to come soon. Um, James Boris saying, I've heard some reviews in the fantasy book YouTube world talking about Martin, George R. Martin, making things 
uh, violent scenes feel visceral without being excessively descriptive. Uh, when rereading the series, it's surprisingly true. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he, I, I think I can see what you mean. I would, I will take that into my next reread uh, as well, and I'll have a, and I'll have a think about that. Okay, um, and with that, uh, if you are watching this back a little bit later, appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to uh, other live streams that I have done. Appearing somewhere around here is a link to my Patreon page if you wish to support this channel. Patrons, thank you um, uh, for uh, your support. Um, I genuinely can't do what I do without your support, so thank you. Uh, moderators, try to get you some love at the top of this stream. I'm going to give you some love at the bottom of the stream as well. You are amazing. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, but that's it for this week. I will be back same time next week. But keep an eye out for some other stuff between now and then. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you again soon.